Hello there, this is John Coleshaw, and I'm just slightly bothering the voice of John Perkley for a moment. I don't know, maybe a regeneration might happen. Yes, it happened there. Yes, and you're listening to The Sirens of Audio. Wonderful chaps. Well, hop on. G'day audiophiles, this is the Sirens of Audio, the show that explores the universe of Doctor Who and the audio medium. My name's Dwayne, and Philip's not with me right now, but he will be shortly, so never fear. Today is going to be a special episode where we are going to be sharing our thoughts on the entire audio range of Time Lord Victorious, which is about five releases from Big Finish and one release from Big uh, BBC Audio. And we were asked to do this on for a different podcast. The guys from Prog to Who a couple of years ago asked us to do these reviews uh, for their show, which was really good. And uh, in the middle of that, not long after we started, they changed their podcast to Around the Console. So if you look up the guys from Around the Console, Sookie Bob Craig and the gang, John and Cliff, the others that I just couldn't think of for a second, um, you'll be able to hear our our thoughts. And because they reviewed the entire Time Lord Victorious series a couple of years ago, and they invited us on just to talk about the audios. So what I'm going to share with you today is those. So when we talk about the guys from Proctor Who or around the console, uh, you'll know what we're talking about. And uh, yeah, we're going to share all those reviews. We have something extra too, because... One of the stories is Genetics of the Daleks, which is a fourth Doctor story written by Jonathan Morris that we uh, spoke with about a long time ago now, and we've never shown that interview. So we're going to be sharing the interview with Jonathan Morris on Genetics of the Daleks, so I'm looking forward to sharing that with you. In addition to our chat with Jonathan Morris, one of the writers, we're also going to be speaking with another writer and producer for the series overall, Alfie Shaw. So that's right at the end. Stick around for that. Alfie's great to listen to. Very enthusiastic about the project. Um, also, uh, the first couple of stories in the audio Time Lord Victorious range are a couple of short trips. Now, one of the authors, Theo Trithui, has had a name change since then. So because of the age of these interviews, we will be referring to Theo's previous name. So please be uh, be mindful of that, that it is an archival piece of material. Um, so that is just for your information. So uh, with that said, we're going to get into it. Now, most of these reviews, apart from the first one, we have video for as well. But the very first one on the short trips, we didn't record the video. We just did it the old-fashioned way uh, for audio only. So that goes for about 10, 12 minutes uh, with us talking about it. I'm going to put something up on the screen for you to watch while you listen. But all the rest of the discussions and reviews of the Time Lord Victoria series will have video. So with that said, I'm going to throw in a trailer for Time Lord Victoria, Short Trips, Master Thief and Lesser Evils. And then we're going to get into it. From Big Finish Productions. The soft shine of the glass caught another creature, an immaculate bearded figure, carrying a blue cylinder under one arm. The Master. Doctor Who, Time Lord Victorious. Short trips. Master Thief. You had the most glowing recommendation, she told him. The Advocate General is a good friend. He demurred. In fact, the master had met the old woman just once, for all of five minutes. She recommended you, too. I mean, the repository. Your personal service. Turning a corner, two guards stood in his way. They raised their weapons as the master raised his. Their screams reverberated down the dark passageway. More guards came running to intercept, but he cut them down without mercy. You will obey me. Lesser evils. Death descended 
on the planet Alexis, one bright and crisp, clear morning. The Katuru now bent and placed her hands on top of the dense litter of the forest floor. The creatures of and in the ground were drawn to her warmth and power. They came to her voluntarily. She brushed the carapace of a tiny globular bug and constrained it to a lifespan of weeks. A most intriguing species, said the man in black velvet. The woman didn't flinch, but incredibly, she hadn't known he was there. I take it, he said agreeably, eyes now on the woman, that I have the pleasure of addressing the due representative of the all-hallowed Kuturu. I am your humble servant. He bowed, though there was something playful, insincere in his movement. Did he dare to mock her? Now that I have your attention... <laughs> Big finish. We love stories. Well, thank you, Bob, for having us on the legendary podcast that is Proctor Who. My name's Dwayne. And my name is Philip. Thank you very much for asking us to have a little chat about Time Lord Victorious. Now, Philip, Short Trips, Master Thief and Lesser Evils. This was the first time I had dipped into the Time Lord Victorious saga at all. Was that the same for you? It was the first, yes, the first time I was like, listened to. Okay. So, so what I was most excited about was the fact that John Colshaw was doing both Masters. Um, I hadn't yet heard Masterful, in which John Colshaw does the Roger Delgado Master in Terror of the Master. Absolutely brilliant story. So this was the first taste I had of him doing Roger Delgado. I'd heard him do the only Master in the Five Doctors, so I knew how well he could do it. So I was very, very excited about this. But um, the first the first foray into Time Lord Victorious was the story Master Thief. So it was a Roger Delgado Master story. And uh, what were your initial thoughts on, on that story? Well, I, I thought John Colshaw was amazing. And the way he mm. narrates and reads is just brilliant. I must admit, I actually I listened to both these stories walking around a football oval um, up at Port Stephens, which is about two, three hours north of Sydney. I was on holidays and I downloaded it and I was just walking round and round a football stadium and I got to the end of, actually I think both of them, and went, what was that? <laughs> so I think my initial impression was I just didn't quite get them. Um, and I guess I, I thought at the time maybe it was because I didn't know really how they fit in with the whole Time Lord Victorious thing. But certainly, I, I finished finished both of them. It was a bit confused. Um, the first one, Master Thief, in particular. I, well, I, once again, the performance was great. The story was simple. I think the thing that struck me most was it felt like it belonged to the Pertry era. Era. I, I could almost feel that you know the Third Doctor and Sarah Jane were off on Peladon while this is happening. Uh, it did feel like the two things could be happening side by side in terms of the, the storytelling. And it certainly has a dramatic ending, but in terms of, I guess, of both of this one, to me, held together most, mostly in terms of its self-contained story that I didn't need to know outside of it. So I guess this was probably, the, for me, the first time the most satisfying. My views changed when I listened to it again this week, but <laughs> initially, this was probably the one I enjoyed the most. What, what did you think, Dwayne? So Delgado, the Delgado master was doing things in this particular story that we're used to. So we were used to him doing things during the Third Doctor era, like going and, and stealing the, the Doomsday weapon from uh, in, in Colony in Space. So it's a similar kind of thing to that, where he's going and, and trying to steal some secret that he's, that he's found out about. So um, that was very good. Um, there were some new elements introduced by Sophie Isles, the writer too, um, to this story. He didn't have... It, it, Reference the fact that he could shrink things, but his the weapon that he used was not a shrinker. It was something that was totally different, which I probably shouldn't mention because well, it might spoil the story because it's very integral to the plot towards the end of the story. The particular weapon, the particular weapon that he used, but it was quite graphic in in places. I thought it, it felt it felt very Ian Martrish in terms of gore. 
in description. Yeah. It, it, right. it, it wasn't third Doctor description, it was much more Ian Martyr description, yes. As to Time Lord Victorious, how it fit in, I had absolutely no idea how it would fit in, so I was uh, completely in the dark. But as a standalone story, I think it worked well. The characterization was great. Then we got into Lesser Evils, and my first impressions of that was that, oh boy, John Colshaw is amazing as Anthony Ainley's version of the Master. He had all the in- inflections on there. Uh, the story itself was very interesting. It, there was a lot of exposition throughout this story rather than action. Um, although we did get a bit of action, but a lot of exposition, a lot of dialogue between the Kuturu alien and the master, which completely went over my head. I had no idea what they were talking about, really, which made... Uh, and I, I think the Time Lord Victorious has touted itself as being, well, you can dip into any story and listen and you'll be fine. They're all standalone stories. Well, I didn't feel like this one was a standalone story. Having listened to it again just today, you can see how it ties in with the first master story as well. Um, some interesting things that they kept pointing out about Anthony Ainley. I don't know if you picked up on this, but uh, it was referenced throughout that story that the only master had two hearts which was something that i wasn't uh, ever aware of was it ever established that he had two hearts well he took over Trimus's body but i don't know that's interesting isn't it? I, yes i don't know that either because i always assumed that he didn't have a have a time lord body but perhaps uh when the beaver's master merged with uh Tremus, uh, perhaps uh, he retained that Time Lord DNA when he had the uh, when he had the only body. Although the only master uh, was destroyed a few times and brought back a few times in ways that we that we never really knew. But yeah, when with, with the breathing that uh, John Colshaw was doing and the inflections in the voice, it was just superb, and I loved it for that. As for how it fit into the story, um, well. I'll tell you a bit more about how the story slotted into me in a moment, but what were your thoughts on Lesser Evils? Uh, I agree with what you're saying in lots of ways. I think what was interesting was the world building of Alexis, the, the planet at the beginning. So this is a Simon Guerrier story, and usually his stories are very people character driven. And so I was actually quite surprised that so much time was devoted to the world building of a planet, which I must admit, see, once again, I don't know how it fits in. Um, <laughs> so, maybe, yeah, may, it might be my mind. I struggle to remember things, maybe. And so I haven't worked, worked out where this story fits into the whole Time Lord Victorious scheme of things yet. Uh, the Couture I do know because I, I bought the books. Because I, mm-hmm. I did feel like I was just missing too much in the series. And so I did get the two books. And that's one of those books deals, which both those books deal with the Couture. And so suddenly I understood what was going on here. But when I first listened to this, I had no idea what was going on. And, yeah. and to be perfectly honest, I still don't get the Keturah. I don't really understand them as an alien race. I don't really get how they can do what they do, what their purpose is. I mean, I, understand, I mm. know what their purpose is because it tells you blatantly. But how they have that power to do what they do, I don't mm. get any of that. I didn't understand anything about the Keturah either until I got the books, which were released about a month after this. So... Uh, and it was probably six weeks, maybe two months after this that I actually got round to reading the books. So, but I was glad I did because it it's sort of uh, I think the, the the books are called the Night, the Fool, and the Dead, and All Flesh is Grass. Now in the Time Lord Victorious listings, it says All Flesh is Grass Part One and Part Two. I I've only seen one part. I don't know where this Part Two comes from. But uh, the two books, when you read those together, you know much more about the Katuru who they are, how they how they come from the dark times, uh, in those dark times of Gallifrey way before, with all the other godlike aliens out there, like the Osirens and things like that. The Keturu actually remind me a lot of Sutek. You know, he brings his gift of death to all humans. And yeah, so he's, he's one of these dark time aliens as well. And the Keturu is just one of those, you know, the demons as well, um, are from that time period it's alluded to at any rate. So, um... Yeah, I think you get a much better understanding of these stories if you read 
the book. So I would definitely recommend that. And I'm sure the guys from Proctor Who will get round to that very shortly. I'm sure they will. <laughs> so, I mean, I enjoyed them. As I said, Lesser Evil and Oshawa stand alone. Of, of all the Time of Victorious, these two are probably, I think, in my mind, probably the weakest. They, they're well performed. I'm not saying that. To be fair, part of it is, is the short trip format doesn't always grab me. So, I think the short trip format has a, a potential to have a lot of creativity. When it's simply narrating a story, um, I think it's a great way for new authors to get a foot in the door, for big fans to check out what authors are like. But they still often do feel like they're newish authors, which is strange for Simon Guri because he's experienced as. But this is, I think, this is Sophie Alice's first work for Big Finish, mm-hmm. so it still feels like they're still learning, developing authors, which I guess they are. And and I felt that both of these didn't quite feel. And so with the Simon Guri one, which usually I, I always love and love all he does, but there's a lot of stuff stone holding and passing and. And, and I actually went back and listened to the ending and again, and I still get, I'm still a bit confused by how it ends. But maybe that's just me. <laughs> I, th- I think when you um, listen to the Big Finish audio that's coming out in April 21, uh, Echoes of Extinction, I think if you just listen, just think about the title, Echoes of Extinction, you think about the weapon that the Master was using in Master Thief. Um, you think about what the Keturu actually do. There's something timey-wimey that's going to happen. Uh, we've got alternate timelines going all over the place. And I think uh, that's going to be ultimately resolved. But at this stage, the next audio that was to be released was He Kills Me, He Kills Me Not. And uh, you're in for a treat with that one. Because we've, sure. we've, we've got we've got Brian the Ood Assassin to look forward to. Yes, it, it, it certainly picks up from here. And then the, these aren't bad, but what's to come? Genetics of the Daleks, um, Brian the Ood, um, some, of the, some of the audios that are coming out are top-notch. Yeah. That's it for uh, our Short Trips review. Bob and the boys from Proctor Who, back to you. From Big Finish Productions. What do you think? A transmat capsule? Looks more like a depressed cupboard. Doctor Who, Time Lord Victorious. Echoes of Extinction. Are you lost, sir? Perpetually. That's usually by design. Edwards. Welcome home, sir. Did you enjoy your massacre? No. They all died too quickly. Find me someone else to kill. Of course, sir. This place should have a security system. Let's see if I can get a look at what we're dealing with. Oh, that's odd. I wonder. I'm not sure I like how all the options seem to end in death. That's how life works. You're a coward as a killer, and when you die of death, all alone, no one will care. Thank you for killing them for me. Oh, I'd kill everyone for you. If this thing just wiped out your entire species, it needs to be stopped. It needs to be stopped. Well, thanks, Bob, for uh, letting us talk about the next in the Time Lord Victoria series, Echoes of Extinction, the Eighth Doctor side. It's really exciting, Philip, to hear the boys and their excitement of audio, particularly on the short trips from last time. I was very happy to hear. Hopefully they might listen to a bit more audio drama on Prog to Who, Philip. Because audio rocks. Yeah, well done, boys. Keep (laughs) listening to the audio stuff. It's great. So Echoes of Extinction, it was specifically designed vinyl release. So that's why you've got the two... 29 minute episodes it was supposed to come out what november last year was it january i think it was delayed a couple of times it it was was, uh, i think my expectations for this was it was somehow tie up the time lord victorious arc and we'd have a bit more in it but it's not what we got we got a nice little prologue we got a bit of a coda with the 10th Doctor side, but we're looking at the 8th Doctor side, and this is pretty much a standalone story. I think it's a very good story, actually. And it's got Paul Clayton, who plays Mr... Is it Mr. Colchester in Torchwood? I think it is. Just Colchester in Torchwood, yes. Oh, forget the Mr.? Forget the Mr. He's just Colchester. Yeah. So we don't normally get those actors... Well, Paul Clayton's been in a couple of other Doctor Whos, but Burn, Burn Gorman in particular... Definitely not. Pretty simple story as far as links to the Time Lord Victorious series. Didn't really get much of a link to that because I think it's tied up more with the 10th Doctor side and the opportunity that he has. I think the the Time Lord Victorious link in this is 
uh, a reference to a line that the Doctor makes in He Kills Me, He Kills Me Not, which in chronological terms we haven't heard yet. He's he's on a quest for the to see the 700 greatest wonders of the universe, and that's pretty much it. Other than that, it's a self-contained story, which, uh, which I enjoyed. What about you, Philip? Well, I think Alfie Shaw did a great job. Alfie Shaw's probably better known for being in charge of all the short trips. Uh, but he's, he's done a good writing job here in terms of this story. It, as you said, it's, it's, not, it's a, not complex, but anything that Paul McCann is, is in is going to be good because he just knows how the Doctor works. And just he, he's such a hero Doctor, I guess. And so I guess mm. the moment he arrives, you know he's going to be heroic and sacrificial, so sacrificial. These are the, the two traits that Paul McGann really brings out really strongly. Uh, Bern Gorman, as you said, uh, great. What an amazing actor Bern Gorman is. I think I was a bit disappointed that his voice was probably just a bit too disguised. Mm. Like, I was really struggling to recognize it as Bern, Bern's voice. Because I love Bern's voice. I love it the way he acts. I, I do think the character was unbelievably sinister. And, yeah, I, th- I think it was, it was a good villain to have, complex villain to have. Um, Part of the issue with the story is, as it's 29 minutes long, and there's a lot of exposition that Alfie had to put in, and so it really felt tightly packed. Mm. And there's a couple of times I actually need to go back today and re-listen, because I listened to it when it first came out last month, but there's a lot of stuff that I obviously missed, and there was some stuff I wasn't, I was trying to make sure that the links all held together, which they did do, but I did have to go back and re-listen to a few sections of tight exposition. There's a, you know, there's a scene where the doctor's inside network's mind and then there's a conversation when he comes out and I really had to pay attention to those two scenes to actually know what had happened and why it had happened and who was the villain and, and what was going on there so it's a standalone story it's a good story I think it, it does feel even though it's standalone it feels like it needs more so it, it is actually in some ways kicking off the whole what, time of victorious on the doctor's side of things but yeah, I, th- I enjoyed it. it. Worked well. As far as putting more story in there, unfortunately, it is constricted by the vinyl format. This is specifically designed for vinyl, so it, even at 29 minutes, it's really stretching it because vinyl's not really designed to go much past your 22, 25 minutes. Even though stories have been released on vinyl, they've been pressed from existing stories, but this one was totally created from scratch, which is all part of the Time Lord Victorious package. Plan. Uh, yeah, the, the grand master plan of James Goss. I, I, you know, I would actually like to listen to it on vinyl, because yeah. I, I think the sound design of things have been done to hear it on vinyl. Yeah. And, and yeah, I, I had a hu- still have a huge record collection. I, I do like vinyl, but I must admit, I've never started the collection of Doctor Who and vinyl. I think I have too, too many collections going already, <laughs> and that really wouldn't be the end of my marriage. Uh, but that being said, um, I would be curious to hear how the sound design worked on vinyl with the crackling, with the the other noises that come as part of it. And certainly in terms of the whole network idea in terms of the the network of sound and crackling and waves and things, I do suspect that the hearing it on vinyl would actually add a whole new dimension to what's going on inside that spaceship. So I'm keen to hear what the boys at Proctor Who have to say about this story because it's a thumbs up from me. It's not going to give you any massive answers in terms of Time Lord Victorious. It's just one of those standalone stories. It's what they've always said, though, from the start, is that you can dip into any of them. And this is a perfect example of that. If you want to get into the Time Lord Victorious, into the meat of it, you're going to have to wait until the books. That's where you're going to get most of your information on how it all fits together. But uh, as far as this goes, love it. From Big Finish Productions. If you allow me to end her life, then we could stop all this... Excessive exertion. I wouldn't need to run. You wouldn't need to run. And she wouldn't need to breathe. Doesn't that sound nice? Doctor Who, Time Lord Victorious. He kills me, he kills me not. Days since last mortality, 2023. You must be disappointed that the number is so high. It's called Brian. Brian? What kind of name for an assassin is Brian? Two planets away from Athana is... No, don't tell me, don't tell me. I know this. It is Genophil. No, Hawkesila. What happened to Genophil? Never heard of it. Uh, oh, this is vexing. 
It's not about the statue. It's what it represents, or rather what its absence represents. When something as steadfast, solid, and fixed in time as the statue of Kithal just disappears, there must be something very wrong with time itself. Big finish. We love stories. Okay, thanks, Bob. Here we are. Thanks for inviting us back onto Proctor Who. It's great to be able to talk about the things that we love, Philip, um, and that is audio through Time Lord Victorious. This time we're going to be talking about Time Lord Victorious, He Kills Me, He Kills Me Not by Carrie Thompson. What were your initial thoughts, Philip? Well, I um, I loved it in terms of a lot of the ideas. And there's, there's, bits, there's bits in terms of it. It's not a huge, complex story. It's certainly nothing uh, epic or monumental. But in terms of, it's an it's a amusing Western, it's got some interesting characters, and I just love Brian the Ood. So I think, if anything, <laughs> the, the thing that made this for me was um, having Brian the Ood appear. He's amusing, the way he talks to Mr. Ball, the way he threatens people. He was just an interesting character, interesting baddie. And he, hearing Silas, oh, I forgot his name. The actor. Carson. Silas Carson. Oh, Silas Carson, thank you. Even Silas Carson was just great. It was interesting going back and listening to this for... Uh, a, a, I listened to it another couple of times, actually, because uh, there were bits of this story. You got It's one of those ones where you've got to focus on completely all the way through, otherwise you miss little bits. It's all explained, but you've got to be careful that you don't let your mind wander too much. Um, I... When I listened to this for the first time, I was very excited. I, I It was the first full story that was released on audio in the Time Lord Victorious uh, series. Last month, we reviewed uh, Echoes of Extinction. Uh, So by that stage, we'd heard all the Time Lord Victorious audios, but this was the first full cast one with with the Eighth Doctor, uh, written by Carrie Thompson. So uh, she hasn't written too much for Big Finish, but what she had written, I had listened to just before hearing this. So she'd written a short trip called The Second Oldest Question, which was a fifth Doctor Nyssa story. So read by Sarah Sutton. I don't know if you remember it, Philip. Do you remember that? The Second Oldest Question? I do remember it. And uh, I actually looked up again today when we just uh, have a quickness into the beginning of it. Because I was curious as to how a little hit to her style. Yeah. So uh, anyone who likes this particular story uh, by Carrie Thompson, go and check out the short trip uh, the second oldest question. It is a really, really quirky story and written in such a different style that I was very excited about this one. But you're right, this one is more of a, it's more of a straight down the line, uh, run of the, or it's not run of the mill. It's a, it's a basic story. It's not overly complex. Um, it it was very engaging. The the links to Time Lord Victorious on second listen have become more apparent to me. So the Doctor. There's a, a big Time Lord Victorious sort of uh, plot point in here where the planet he's arrived on is supposed to, is supposed to be this ocean world, uh, but it's not. So something is going on with time. Some timeline has jumped and the Doctor is, is saying something's not right here because this planet is not how I remember it. So uh, I thought that was that was very interesting. Uh, he's, he's still searching for those 700 uh, wonders of the world and uh, and wondering why the one he's seeking is not here, which is a throwback to Echoes of Extinction 2, the last audio uh, chronologically in the Time Lord Victorious uh, series. I did note at the time that the Eighth Doctor was sounding tired. I don't know if that's a... I don't know if that's a... Uh, done on purpose by Paul McGann and the production team because it's sort of towards the end of perhaps... The Eighth Doctor's life. He's sort of trying to run away from the Time War, and he's in that particular period. So he's been around for a for a while, and he's sounding very tired. Um, what did you did you feel that too, Philip? Or it was a bit hard to know. I mean, they, they they use the Time War theme, so it's telling us it is towards the very end of Paul McGann's yes. stint. So they they, they which sit- I don't like, by the way. You don't like the, you don't like the theme. No, no, I, I just can't. I can't sort of gel with any Eighth Doctor theme other than the David Arnold theme. It's just not right to me. Oh, so I really enjoy it. I love all the clay metal and the bangs, bits and pieces and the percussion. And oh, that's It's used I- for the War Doctor and it's used for, I think it's used for one of the Seventh Doctor uh, novels as well. I thought it was the War Master. I think it was used for... Is it used for the War Master as well or does he have a different theme? No, he's got a different theme. Different theme. So it's I think it's used similar. for at least two Doctors, if not three. So... 
uh, yeah, it's not it's not specific to the Eighth Doctor. It, I mean, it's good, but it, to me, it just doesn't gel with uh, the Eighth Doctor. Okay, well, I like it. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I guess it's interesting. You skip them. You skip them. Yeah, I do. No, this is. It, I stopped <laughs> listening to it today, so there you go. Because it actually kept me listening rather than skipping it today. Um, I, I think I do think it's, I do enjoy the storyline. I think I do like the idea of it being a western. Is amusing. Um, and so I think it does capture a lot of those ideas, those early Western ideas, which I think are great. I do think you know, there's a typical range of characters. It's almost it's almost like the gunfighters, and there's lots of bits that. So in my head, I'm picturing the gunfighter set. I'm picturing the the um, the, the canteen and the doctor's surgery. They mm. they use the same locations as they use mm. for the gunfighters. I don't know how deliberate that is. Uh, I, and- I uh, must admit, I did think. Uh, along those exact same lines too, although it's not as funny as the gunfighters, uh, I did think the same. Yeah. So I, 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 yeah, it's, I think it's a little bit to that. I think Scott's done a marvelous job. It's one of the first things they actually did in lockdown, and so in mm. terms of being able to pull a cast, it's a very young cast, and most of the cast haven't appeared in anything else. And it's, it's just that the, you know, the authors have only done one other piece for Big Finish. I think do think the Time Lord Victoria set has been a good opportunity for Big Finish to test out new writers. And to feel safe in doing that, in terms of, yeah, the old big finished stalwarts aren't going to care too much in terms of this range necessarily. So a lot of the writers are, are, are trying out new things. So I think that works well in terms of this story and, and trying out a new writer. So yeah, I think there's a, there's a, some good, great stuff in it. As I said, I, I do like a country, a, a, you know, a western, uh, and this this does that well. And what did you think of Brian? As uh, as a character, Brian the Ood. When when I first heard the name uh, before this was released, I knew this character was coming, and it sounds absolutely ridiculous. It sounds like it can't possibly work. But my feeling at the time was, no, this is big finish. They have done. They have got a good track record of of seemingly crazy things being put forward to us to consume, but they usually end up doing a fantastic job. And I think this was a typical example of that, something that you don't think could possibly work. And this was absolutely perfect. The dialogue that Brian the Ood was uh, was given was uh, sensational. Uh, it was funny. He was terrifying. Uh, you felt a bit sorry for him at times. It it was just a great character. And it's, it's probably what got me interested to expand in uh, in the Time Lord Victorious universe, and I started looking forward to the the books that were coming out uh, to find out a lot more about Brian. Yeah, I agree. I think Brian is probably the standout thing that makes the whole thing work. I'm, I'm not sure it would work the same way without him and, he, and the, his humour and the way he's written. Uh, just go back to the thing that you were saying before, too, and just, it's making me think in terms of the whole Time Lord Victorious series. One of the things I thought listening through it in terms of actually things that weren't answered and it's interesting having now listened to everything and read a number of the books, so I dipped into quite a bit more of the Time Lord Victorious than I meant to. I'm actually feeling like it's actually not gelling together to me as well as I thought it would do. So having done, you know, we, we talked about the first story, the Echoes of Extinction, um, so, and we've, you know, I've done, I'm trying to think what else has come between now and then, but certainly as I look at the whole package, I'm not seeing all the links that clearly. And having now listened to everything, read the books, I thought the second time going through, I'd see the links a bit more clearly than I am. I, I I know that they wanted things to be standalone-ish, but it's obviously pointing for things, but I'm not sure everything always picks up properly. I I get exactly what you're saying. I was thinking I was thinking the same thing. I'm picking up on the on the the big arc inferences, but how they all fit together, I'm also finding myself thinking, mm, maybe I should go back and read the books again. Um, maybe I should uh, watch the Daleks animation again. Uh, and because obviously this one ends on a cliffhanger and goes, I, th- I think it goes directly into the next one, it does. which is the enemy of my enemy. So, uh, and it was the enemy of my enemy, the one straight after this that uh, really brought home those Dalek characters that we first saw in the Dalek animation. So, um, yeah, you, you make a very good point there. Um, it's it's uh, it's got the Time Lord Victorious banner on it, but yeah, it's still. Having heard everything that I have, yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right, mm. now that I think of it, too. So what about some of the themes? Is there anything that stood out for you that you weren't so impressed with, Dwayne? Well, you know there was, Philip, because I've, <laughs> I've spoken to you about it. Oh, I was, um, just, I was leading into casually so no one would notice the fact that we may have talked about it first. <laughs> look, there, it's 
people people say that Doctor Who has always addressed political issues, but I think we're in a period in history where individuals like never before have been so engaged politically because we get that instantaneous um, engagement through social media and we can react straight away. Like, you know, for instance, when the Green Death was made back in 1973, um, yes, the, the oil crisis and climate change was a political issue, but the only way people could engage with it was by talking to their their, their local member or by reading the newspaper and then talking to family. They couldn't actually get so involved and so hyped up about it. You know, they'd read the newspaper and then get on with the rest of their day. All right, so political issues, yes, they've always been there, but when they're put in Doctor Who today, they can be much more reactionary. And I got one of those reactions in this, um, in as much as uh, part of the plot of this story was that the girls were running away, or one of the girls in particular was running away from her father because... Uh, there wasn't too much said about this particular culture that she'd come from, that the the parents were creating these designer babies to basically be servants to them, and the children were supposed to be servants to them. And um, she was making comments throughout the play saying how um, her father just wanted to control her. And it it just reminds me of the of the of the noise that's being made uh, throughout a lot of social circles, political circles at the moment about patriarchy and how horrible it is and uh, how everyone's got to, you know, rebel against it. And uh, it's it's not a particular uh, viewpoint that I share. So it sort of got my back up a little bit and I didn't notice it the first time around, but I've been, uh, you know, I was a little bit more sensitive to it this time. So I didn't like that aspect about it, but when I was talking to you about it, Philip, you made a good point too that there's younger actors, uh, younger writers coming in, I should say, with uh, less experience, and they've got these viewpoints and they want to express them, and they're they're possibly doing it in ways that aren't quite so subtle. Well, it certainly wasn't subtle to me anyway. It annoyed me a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it is, well, the thing that struck me listening to it actually. Actually, did it, did it actually struck me last time, and I thought maybe it's just, you know I'm a grumpy old man with lots of kids, and uh, I hear my kids whinging, <laughs> my kids whinging all the time about being controlled, and you know that's not fair. Yeah. I, I, it is something yeah. that adolescents go through, and um, I've actually done marking for we, we we have an exam in Sydney in New South Wales called the Basic Skills Test, where we test every child year five, seven, nine, oh, three, five, seven, and nine, and they have to do a piece of writing, and I actually. Have for a couple of years, um, a few years back, marked all this adolescent writing, all this year nines writing, and every second story had something about how awful parents were and how controlling they were, and it, I just thought I'll just grow up. And yeah, to, to, to me, it was just adolescent writing, and you know, people grow out of it. Uh, you see a bit of it in you know, the Twilight series, other things, in terms of you know, which is for adolescents. So it just, just to me, it was sort of thrown in there, and I sort of thought, oh, it's it's a it's a writer who's young and. One day she'll grow up and she'll appreciate her parents more. We can only hope. We can only hope. <laughs> but that, but apart from that, that's the one thing that sort of niggled me a bit. But the story itself, um, really good to listen to. It's always good to hear Paul McGann as the Eighth Doctor. And uh, really looking forward to the next one uh, because it's it finished on a cliffhanger and went straight into it. I think these two, this one and the next one, were released within about a week of each other. So yeah, we were. virtually got them at the same time. Or were they released on the same day? I think they were the, I I, the same day. My memory. I was. think. I think. I, I think you might be right. But anyway, looking forward to uh, having a listen to that one for next month. Yeah. So back to you, Bob. Yeah. Thanks, Bob, for having us again. From Big Finish Productions. Greetings, citizens of Rax. We are the Daleks. We come in peace. Doctor Who, Time Lord Victorious. The enemy of my enemy. You will be exterminated! Not until the Doctor has given us what we need. And what is that? Your help. What exactly do Daleks fear? That the changes will spread? That Skara will no longer birth your race? That you will cease to exist? And what do you observe, Doctor? 
Oh, you know pretty much everything. I have a particular interest in new cultures and societies. The Raxians are an ancient civilization. So I gather. But you are new to me, and that's very exciting. We are one. <laughs> I think I know what the Devolver does. You can't do this. You can't! The Daleks, the Raxians, and the Time Wars. All their lives are now entwined. And I can end them all in an instant. Big finish. We love stories. Guess what, Philip? What, Dwayne? Bob's invited us back on Prog to Who to talk about some more Time Lord Victorious. Bob's a nice guy, but he's not very smart sometimes, can I just say. <laughs> oh, thanks for having us back, Bob. We're talking about the enemy of my enemy this time, which is, to me, uh, when I first heard this, it, it really uh, jumped out at me the first time I heard it. And when I re-listened to it for this little review, uh, it smacked me between the eyes again. And all I can say about this one is, well, I can say more, but the first thing I'll say is, wow, it is a fantastic story so far. If I was listening to this chronologically, uh, this would be my favourite Time Lord Victoria story so far. Well, you are listening to it chronologically, so yeah. it is. Yeah, okay. No question about it. <laughs> I'd have to fully agree with you, Dwayne. It certainly is a standout. And yeah, it's, it's interesting going back and listen to it again, because I remember being impressed by it the first time through. But I was, at the time, I was listening to lots of stuff, a bit overwhelmed. And second listens are always so much better. You pick up so much more, so much more of the humour, the dialogue, you know what's going on. And yeah, I have really enjoyed this so much more. This I enjoyed it the first time, but this time, it really does stand out for so many reasons. And where I was struggling to find connections to the Time Lord Victorious arc in previous episodes, this one is just full of them. So... I could, uh, I could really tie this into the full arc. They're talking about it a lot. The Doctor, the Daleks between themselves, the, pla the planet and the people that they encounter together. Um, so I think this one ties in best so far to the Time Lord Victorious arc. Yeah, I agree. So, I mean, it's a straight follow-on from the last story that we looked at in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, with Briar the Ood and that wonderful story. Um, but also this then leads directly into the books, which I do have as well. And so you do see that progression of this, the place that this story plays between that audio and the book, which works really well. So you don't need the book, of course, because this is before that. But you're right. It it's, starts to play on the whole idea of the Keturah and death and that whole theme of death that's a very part, large part of this title of Keturahs. You can start to see the theme start to develop through the story. And it, and it features the the uh, devolution. Is it devolution or de-evolution machine? that was featured way back in the very first short trip, Master Thief. So that's back in play here. Um, and it's really interesting to see the Doctor joining forces with the Daleks. It doesn't happen too often. Uh, I can't think of any other stories. Um, there probably is some other stories out there with the, the Doctor joining forces with the Daleks. Death to the Daleks. Big pun? Death to the Daleks. They join forces together to try and get off the planet and... When the Daleks have lost their weapons. Mm. Yeah, I guess. I guess. I guess this is a more in your face. So the whole story begins with the, the cold open and then the theme music starts with the Daleks saying, um, you've got to help us. So it ties in really well with uh, with the theme. You know you know what I love about Big Finish Audios? I love subtle references placed in that you can trace back to even classic Doctor Who, there was a, I don't know if you picked up on this, but there was a reference where the Doctor is heading somewhere with the time strategist. So uh, the time strategist in the story is trying to uh, protect the Doctor from the other Daleks who just want to kill him. And they are, are heading along and they get to this ladder or something like that. And the Doctor says, oh, you might look like you've got an old casing, but you must have this such and such circuit. I can't remember what he calls it. Uh, uh, can't remember the name of the circuit off the top of my head. Uh, and then the Dalek says, elevate. So like like in the new, there's a, so there's a link to the new series and there's a link to the classic series where older Daleks possibly could not fly. Did you pick up on that? Yes, there's, uh, I must admit the elevate was a, a nice touch and it was done very much like the Dalek in Dalek, mm -hmm. which is interesting because, I mean, the time strategist has a very distinct voice. Mm. Um, actually, I, I, I mentioned, Nick Briggs is unbelievable in this story, and mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure I tweeted it at the time. I have been blown away by Nick Briggs' performance in terms of 
every dialect is so different and so distinct. And the, the old saying goes, I mean, the reason why Davros was created was because the dialects can't do dialogue. Whereas this, this audio actually disproves that because you have the dialects doing dialogue brilliantly. You have one actor, which is astounding, playing all the different dialects so distinctly. As they have conversations, you know exactly which the dialect is it's talking without a problem, which you, which you think would be hard to do on audio with just dialects, but it is so distinct. And the way that they, the characterization of each dialect comes out and the, their deviousness or their you know, murderousness, depending on who they are, um, yeah, Nick just nails it perfectly. I didn't look through the cast list prior to that, but did you know Jacob Dudman was in it? Yes, he was yeah, one of the guards. He was uh, yeah, back and forth. Was- uh, I didn't I didn't pick up, but as you would expect with Jacob Dudman, a phenomenal voice artist on, along the same lines as John Colshaw. Uh, you know, in, in 10, 15 years' time, Jacob Dudman could be the next John Colshaw, you know? Yeah, I think that uh, Big Finish have found an amazing person there, just like they were Sheridan Smith. They've, they've, they've found a couple of stars on the rise. And I think mm. Jacob Dub, Dub is one of them. Yeah, absolutely. I was very excited about uh, about this story and very much back into the Time Lord Victorious arc because it's been left, left me feeling a bit cold the last few releases. But this one, absolutely superb stuff. And uh, you... You can't go. You can't go very wrong with the enemy of my enemy, Tracy Ann Bain. She's a new writer for Big Finish. hasn't written an awful lot. I think this was her very first release, wasn't it, Philip? It was. This was her first one, and then about the same time, on very fast as here was the River Song box set at the start of the year. Yeah. Um, Quarter Brave New World. So that that came out very fast as well. Another strong character piece, but character piece between people rather than Daleks. But, yeah. yeah. She writes. She writes really good dialogue. Yeah, I, th- and I, think this is, I was just going to say, I think this struck me in terms of um, her use of humour in the first half of the show was really very clever. So yeah. lots of very funny lines, the Doctor being very disrespectful towards Daleks and you know challenging them and a lot of humour there. But by the end, it had turned very bleak and black. So yeah. it was an interesting journey through from, and I guess that's, she, she knows how to play emotions well because she rode high on terms of you know, interest, humour, to adventure, to bleakness. It was, a, it was a real journey she takes the listener on. Yep. So all in all, I think this was a fantastic release and uh, really looking forward to the next one now, Mutually Assured Destruction, which is the next audio release. Can't remember off the top of my head what's coming chronologically. Uh, but yeah, very much looking forward to that. And uh, any final thoughts, Philip, for you on this one? I say my one negative was yep. interesting. It was, I think, a bit new series. I think the ending surprised me with the Doctor being duped so badly by the Daleks in terms of he doesn't know what they've done or he just he does actually trust them too much, which is interesting. It's, it's, a, it's more of a 13th Doctor sort of trait. I think the 13th Doctor regularly gets duped or doesn't quite know what's going on or acts in a way that doesn't actually um, allow the best of, best of actions at the end of the story. And it was interesting. It felt a bit 13th series with, with how the Doctor at the end is, is, yeah, allows a course of action to happen, which he's even unaware of. Had he tried to stop it, had he, there been other things that could have made it work better, but his failure to even recognise what's happening, to me, felt very Chris Chibnall. But, yeah, okay. a, yeah. Well, one possible explanation for that could be that he's never come across a Dalek quite like the time strategist before. It was a very, very different kind of Dalek and uh, may have found himself trusting it a little bit more than he should have. But, um, yeah, who knows? Who knows? Yeah. Well, that, Interesting fact, point. In, in the next books, the, the other Doctors are going to be pretty disgusted that this Doctor is working with the Daleks anyway. So I guess it is going to follow up and follow on from there. Yeah. Yeah, so it's kind of laying the foundation for that. Mm. Cool. Very good. Thanks very much, uh, Philip. And thank you, boys, from Prog to Who. Uh, it's been great to be guesting on your show once again. So back to you. Have a little adventure, a little excitement, hear what the answer is to a grade one classified question.
Well, g'day, boys, from around the console. Thanks for having us back. Really appreciate it. Philip and I are both here. We're going to talk a bit more Time Lord Victorious. And this is certainly a range that I would like to go back to and maybe see if I can find a bit more of the media, Philip, and, and go through it in order one day, if I ever have the time. Is it? Do you feel that like that? Well, I've certainly been enjoying listening to the uh, Around the Console discussing it week by week. Yeah. Or, or whenever they come up. I mean, I listened to their podcast recently about the two books. And, of course, I really enjoyed the two books. Mm, me too. So it was really great listening to them talk about that. And, you know, I, I'm really enjoying what they're having to say and what they're picking up on. So I know we're only limiting the, the limiting us just to the audio. Um, which, But that in itself, I've enjoyed going back. And particularly this one, because I must admit, I wasn't impressed the first time I heard this. No, you won't. I remember. My, my views have changed slightly. So yeah, let's, this let's... this is, this is related to the books though, because this is set right in the middle of All Flesh is Grass. So if you look on the release timeline, or the story order timeline, this is set in a small, or well, the Minds of Magnox is set in a small group of stories, right in the middle between part one and part two of All Flesh is Grass. So yeah, I I don't recall the details of uh, the Tenth Doctor going off and getting that spaceship and powering it with the TARDIS like he's done in there uh, as much as I feel I wanted to for this, but it, it was mentioned. So it is connected very much to that story and the events that happened in the middle of the book, uh, which is very interesting. Uh, the first thing that struck me about The Minds of Magnox, it was the author, Darren Jones, stu uh, st stuck out in my mine because in 2019 Darren wrote my favorite Doctor Who audio story for Big Finish and that was called Cry of the Vultress. Do you remember that one? It was an Ice Warrior story. I do remember it. Set on an set on a completely alien planet. So all the characters in that story were aliens. And interestingly that was also produced and directed by John Ainsworth who did this for for BBC. So there's a connection there between those uh two people and I think that makes this story interesting to me in that because Cry the Vultress was set on a completely alien planet Minds of Magnox is really visual in that sense too where we get lots of visuals of these weird uh, crazy looking aliens but really explained nicely Jacob Dudbin is always on top form well before we get to Jacob what did you think of the setting of Magnox Philip? Yes, I think you know. I'm I'm not a huge fan of the wildly alien landscapes vistas when big finish usually do them. Um, but can I say this one surprised me at how well and clearly it was explained. So you know, one of the things I can't stand is too much exposition, and you know, often the audios get get criticised for too much exposition. But I guess because this is a story, it's 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 a diff it's allowed to to talk things differently. And certainly, yeah, I it's, a, a, it's not an audio drama. It's strictly. not an audio drama. So yeah, because it's an audio book, it actually changed what what r the rules were, and I think therefore I got a much clearer, better picture early. And in fact, there's stuff that I'd missed the first time. I, th I think partly why I enjoyed this more was I don't think I'd read the book when I'd listened to this the first time. So it that's did, right, because this it, came out before the books, didn't it? Yes, just it did. before, hmm. or at least at least before I was able to get hold of the books because I, I had to wait a little while for them to be sent you know, across from the UK. Um, and so having ha had the knowledge of the books, this did fit in for me a lot better. Um, and also having more recent listened through, um, to Brian the Ood and other bits and pieces, it, it connected a lot better with me than it did the first time I, I heard it. But I do think the world building is actually very powerful. And usually, as I said, aliens, when they're described, often I, I don't get a good enough picture in my head. I think big finish deliberately trying to avoid too much exposition too much explanation and so it is left a lot more to your imagination which for some people they love that um but for me this was actually really well explained and so the aliens and the whole concept of growing bumps and knobs on their heads as they grow in knowledge i thought was a really fascinating idea and as they describe different ones and the different different people um, it, it really stood out. So yeah, I, I loved the idea of the city. I thought the, 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 the library sort of picture was, I, I, for me, it was sort of like, like the um, sound, the sounds of the library sort of idea was there without the books, but you know, big white areas of consoles and things. So yeah, I, I managed to catch the really good picture in my head. It was really well described. I thought. Yeah, agreed. And 
you know I'm a big fan of Jake Dudman, so uh, what were your thoughts on, on his performance in well, this? Well, isn't Jacob always you know, fantastic in terms of his energy levels, the way he describes his characterizations? I, I don't think he's got the perfect Tenth Doctor, but you always, you know, he, he does enough affection towards the Tenth Doctor to know it's him. But the other characters, too, were very powerful. And Brian the Ood, um, he really, to, to me, Brian is a standout character in this. And it was, it was again, nice to get some more of his story. It was. And once again, you know, just with the, the effect that they used and Jacob's voice, he really captured it. Is it Silas Carson? I think he usually does the voice yes. for for the Ood. And so um, Jacob really captures that. And so for me, actually, it was actually the story I was most intrigued by was following Brian the Ood story, um, who's just a fascinating character. I mean, I don't know. I don't think he's a companion. Can, you, can a companion be an assassin? Um, but but yeah so everything that Jacob did was just really clear what, what did you think of Jake? Oh yeah he was great uh, just on Brian the Ood you mentioned that I love I love the uh, backstory uh, on how he was uh, drafted into becoming an, an alien and we had a reference to the uh, lesser order of the uh, what was it the Knights of Oberon yes or the, or the lesser order of Oberon not the Knights of Oberon yeah. Which yep. is which is uh, the character from Revelation of the Daleks, um, so that was that was nice to get that bit of backstory. But just just the whole backstory of the fact that you know, they made him as he was and then he just killed them all. Mm. But yeah, you know, the, the nice one he killed first because he didn't want him to suffer, which is right. very much. I don't know if you read um, you know, Agatha Christie's, um, and then there was none. There's you know, there's yes. ten people all guilty of crimes there, and they're killed off from the um, least guilty to the most guilty. So that those left alive the longest are suffering more, and so you know, the the one who just got drunk and killed a girl on the road, he gets killed off first and doesn't have to go through all the trials of everyone else. Um, and you know, Brian the Ood very much is like that. You know, the, the one he liked the most, he killed him first, and then you know, made everybody else suffer. He just he's an awful character, but you kind of like him. <laughs> so here's a question I had uh, about the story: the the question that the tenth Doctor was going to the minds of Magnox to ask. But Brian the Ood didn't know what the question was. I didn't know the question either. Had Did we know what the question was at this point? Okay, I was worried I'd missed it. I don't know. I, <laughs> I, <laughs> I was I, listening I, and I, could, I didn't get it. I thought maybe it was in a book or maybe it's in a future. It comes out in the second half of the book. I don't know. But that, I don't think that question was ever answered. No. Maybe, it, it, maybe it was the, the reason he left in the middle of all flesh is grass. I don't know. So um, uh, maybe the around the console boys picked up on that, but I I didn't uh, didn't yeah, take away it, too much from the story uh, for me. But yeah, just a little niggle. It's it's an interesting period actually because it is probably I mean I love David Tennant. I think he's I think he's my favorite. He's my favorite new Doctor since the show came back. But this is the period of his time when you really don't like him, and you're not, su- not supposed to like him. You know, the time Lord Victorious is very much him at his craziest and worst. And believing he can do whatever he wants, and that um, was one of your problems when you first heard it, wasn't it? That he yeah, that, he did something so horrible that you you found it hard to uh, reconcile. I, I have issues. Well, yes, I, I have issues with how he's behaving, but I do actually now now we're going through it again, and now we, in context of the books and things, you've I do well. Not, I, I still don't like it. But I still think that is where the Tenth Doctor was, and that's why the Tenth Doctor had to go. That yeah, you know, he he and Rose, their hubris got so great, and the punishment for that was Rose being sent to another dimension. And then you know, Freeman, not Freeman, uh, Martha and Donna kept him stable for the next couple of seasons. But once he lost Donna, he went into a place he shouldn't have gone—a dark place. And it, it's still very much it is in line with the character. It's in line with what the Doctor was doing. I don't like who the Doctor has become, but I do understand in part of the story and the plot. So, yeah, certainly the first time I listened to this, I didn't like how the Doctor was behaving. But in context of where we are in the history of the show, after the War of Mars, in that context where he believes he can do whatever he wants, has the right to do whatever he wants, and he's, he's about to be brought... I mean, you know, the Tunnel of Victorious will bring him back to Earth a bit before he moves on to his final couple of ventures. But yeah, it, it's it's very much in line with where the show was at at this time. But what he did do in the events of the Minds of Magnox was 
uh, well, it, it enabled uh, the appearance of the Eleventh Doctor right at the end uh, in that little coda, which was which was really nice. Obviously, the Eleventh Doctor is the best uh, impersonation that Jacob Dudman does. He's absolutely mm. perfect as the Eleventh. Um, it, it's hard for me to differentiate between the two, and I thought that was a really nice touch. And so so far, we've had what have we had in Time Lord Victorious? The fourth, the eighth. 9th, 10th, 12th and 13th Doctors, I think, were in Time Lord Victorious. Where's the 12th? I think the 12th might be in a comic somewhere. I could be wrong. The 13th um, isn't it? She's, Jodie's not in Yeah, she, she appears at the end of one of the comics, comics I think. Oh, uh, okay. I'm pretty sure. Um, so we've had all those Doctors, and it was nice to get uh, the 11th in uh, in this bit. So Yeah, definitely. Yeah, really nice. Nice stuff. Can't wait for more from from Jacob Dudman um, because there were some great big finish releases that he starred in last year, and um, I hope the boys from around the console are getting more and more enthused about audio because uh, it's been lovely to hear him talk about the audio so far. But the next audio that's to come, which I think uh, I think that one's mutually assured destruction. Uh, I'm waiting to see what uh, what they make of that one because it's uh, pretty awesome. It is indeed. Well, that was great, Dwayne. Good, good, great chatting about this. I've enjoyed it. Thanks, Philip. Thanks, Bob, and the rest of the team at Around the Console. From Big Finish Productions. Divert power to shields. Diverting power will reduce navigational control. Seal the bridge. We have lost outer source of sections, primary laboratory, weapon store, and payload module. Doctor Who, Time Lord Victorious. Mutually assured destruction. I'm just a rat in the skirting boards causing havoc. Now, oh, where is it? Yo, I'm a doctor. Stop me! See, you've been cooped up in the lab too long, forgotten how to shoot in zero gravity. You will learn. You cannot trap the Doctor. He is too dangerous. Your actions have jeopardized the survival of the Dalek Time Squad. You are looking for the TARDIS. You're a bright one. What have you done with it? Purge all aliens. Exterminate. Exterminate. Big finish. We love stories. Righto, thanks, boys. Bob, Sookie, John, uh, Craig, and who's that other fella? Who's the other fella? Oh, Cliff. Cliff, that's right. Thanks for letting us back on to uh, to talk about some audio stuff that we love talking about, Philip. This time it's Time Lord Victorious we Mutually Assured Destruction. We talking audio. We still love it. We do. So... Well, what, g- give us your what, thoughts on the on the story. This, is, this was touted as... Uh, Doctor Who does die hard. It was. Um, can I say, this is probably my favourite, certainly my favourite so far of the audios. It mm. is just non-stop action and adventure. And so I just, I love the passion and I love the the, yeah, the, the die hardness of it all. It, it is great. For the first half is really, I was going to say it's a two-hander. It's kind of a two-hander because it's only the Doctor and Daleks. <laughs> I guess there's lots of Daleks. Um, but Nicholas Briggs and um, Paul McGann are just amazing together. I think for me, the thing that stands out in particular is just the Daleks. Nicholas Briggs is just sensational with every voice that he does because we have a whole range of different Daleks. Um, the strategist, the scientist, the Supreme. Is it the Supreme? Who's the one that's commanding? Do they call him the Supreme? Who's the one in charge? I think he's called the, he's called the Time... The time, time commander or something. Time con- time. No, it's not the time controller, but yeah, it's, it's something to do with time because it's a time squad. So, right. um, but you are you are absolutely right with with this. This is the standout for me. You know, I, I always find in, in Big Finish Dalek Empire to be the most interesting Dalek series because the Doctor's not in it. But this, oh, if if there was more with these Daleks, this time squad absolutely fascinating stuff and it just shows like you said the talents of nick briggs and he does all those different voices live he doesn't change 
Uh, uh, I know. I would really expect him just to lay down one set and then go to the next set. Yeah. He just he just changes the voices as yep. he does the script. So I mean, talk about talking to yourself, crazy as, but it's so effective. And I think because because he's not recording down tracks, it means he is actually acting with himself, responding to himself, and the Daleks come across so much better because of that. But the mm. political intrigue of the Daleks, you've got to love the fact that there's all this politics going on between the different types and levels of Daleks. Um, I guess the time strategist has always had his own agenda and his own plans, which the other Daleks don't like. But just seeing how effective that is in this story, the Doctor never really being sure where to go, who to trust. And even even when he gets separated from the TARDIS, not knowing where the TARDIS is. But he's just going around, sabotaging bits of the ship here, bits of the ships there, and just causing bedlam. So it's, it's, it sounds like there's not much plot, but the story just is, gets driven along. Great dialogue, great action scenes, but it just is, it's relentless. Hmm. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed this. And uh, I was trying to think, because it's a long time between listens, I listen to a lot of stuff in between, so I, I forget detail. But do you remember where this was injected? Within really? the Time Lord Victorious, it's in the it's it's one it's of the a, offshoots it's, it's from the, one of the books, the isn't books. it? It's after the books, so it doesn't. It's it's a bit strange because the sort of the book ends with the time ship being damaged and going out of control, and then this picks up straight from there. So it's it's kind of weird in terms of you, you don't get much backstory to know what's happened beforehand, but because you've just, you just you have enough to know the Doctor's on a time ship, it's out of control, it's it's you know it's degenerating. The Doctor's trying to get out of the dark times and back into normal space and time, having taken the Daleks there in the first place. And just, yeah, so there's there's all those sort of things happening in terms of, but you just don't need to know that. This this is a standalone, even though there's, it's surrounded by so much. I'm sure the boys have talked about how it fits in and surrounds with everything else. They're really good with all that detail and they've been going through everything in order. So they know what's happened next. So yeah, when we listen to this, I'm sure I'll go, oh, that's what they're talking about. I will just mention too, just the other, there are two other cast members, uh, Samantha, Samantha Best and Wilf Scoldy. Um, they're, they're just on the ship. They've been captured by the Daleks that's playing Diska and Groth. And they're the last of their species, the last of their race. And once again, the Doctor working hard to try and protect these people. So yeah, it, it's, it's a driven along plot. Anything else you want to say in terms of casting or the story, Dwayne? Well, yeah, that, the, the more I listen to these Time Lord Victorious, the more I can pick out elements that have been peppered throughout the whole saga about the uh, the Daleks collecting those two um, people from the planet that they destroyed as the last two survivors um, to try and utilize them. But I thought it was fascinating that um, that that uh, what was the character's name? Let me have a look. Tiska. Tiska was a scientist who was actually uh, trying to experiment on the, on the Daleks. Yeah. So there's lots of different things going on. Uh, we're, we're still on this quest. The Eighth Doctor's on this quest to work out where all these disappearing planets are that we, you know, we got a glimpse of that in uh, his previous audio, which was, uh, was it he, he Kills Me, He Kills Me Not? Um, yes, so that's awesome. that arc still running through as well. And uh, hearing these Daleks, it makes me want to go back and watch that animation again uh, with with just the Daleks, because all those personalities are are just fascinating to me. Yeah, really, really enjoyed this. Yeah, I keep wondering whether the character options will bring out a few more Dalek options. Um, I actually I picked up a couple of new Daleks today, actually. Um, the War Doctor from the Big Finish sets. There was a couple of Big Finish sets with Sylvester McCoy's for the Time War and um, the War Doctor. Daleks too, so um, I, I bought them today, and uh, <laughs> this is my shelf here. So I do love all the different character option Daleks that come out and the, with the different colours and variants. So yeah, some of these Daleks would be great to see as well. Um, once again, I, I think Scott Hancock is an amazing director. He really manages to get uh, action happening in the best out of his cast. And so I think once again, how this, this the drivenness of this story is, it's I guess he's really picked up the style a lot in Torchwood. You know, short stories, you know, 50 minute stories, a lot to get in and a lot of a lot of characters to get out, even if there's not a lot of characters to deal with, but a lot of backstory, a lot of understanding. And Scott really just gets his actors to, I don't mind dealing with Nick Briggs and dealing with um, Paul McGann. 
that's not a lot. You know, those two you could probably just run and say go go for it, and you'd get the performances you need. But in terms of making sure the pacing stays up, he's done a really great job with that. Absolutely, it's it's not my personal favourite in the series, but that is yet to come. Right, but I say this is my favourite so far. Yeah, yeah, I hear what you're saying. I hear I'm what not, you're saying. not not limiting myself <laughs> yet. Um, I will just I will just shout out Lizzie Hopley. So we've seen a few. She's becoming more and more prolific in Big Finish these days, isn't she? She really is, and this is one of the earlier ones she, she would have written. I'm trying to think. This was this was recorded in 2020 in March, so this would have been written in 2019. And this, so this is probably one of the very first scripts that she did. I mean, now there's basically something coming out from her every month, hmm. but at this stage it was a fairly early early script. But you can see why, having written something like this, Big Finish would say we want more of her. And of um, course, Lizzie's not a uh, a writer with Big Big Finish first and foremost. Well, no. she is now. She is now, but she started off with Big Finish as an actor. And I always remember her from Night Thoughts, but she appeared before that with um, with the Eighth Doctor playing a companion who's mentioned in Night of the Doctor on TV. That was Gemma. She played Gemma. Did you know that? I did. And she's she's a really brilliant actress. I mean, very impressive in terms of what she does. She talks about the fact that um, part of the reason why she does so much writing is she keeps writing herself parts. And I must admit, when I, <laughs> when, I, when I listened to this, I did suspect that Tiska had been written for her, that she'd actually written, written that role yeah. for her to play. And then they, yeah. the, the rotten um, Scott Hancock cast somebody else instead. <laughs> but yeah, she says she talks about the fact that she now writes, so she gets, writes herself parts. But yeah, excellent stop, job done. Matt Fitton in terms of the script editor and Alfie Shaw with his vision in terms of where this, the whole series is going. I think you know, those guys together, just brilliant. Ian Morris um, did the music. Do we know anything else that Ian has done? Let's have a look. Actually, he's done a heap of stuff. There you go. He's done lots of Time War stuff, short, lots of short trips. He did a number of the Time, the time of Victoria stories. Uh, in fact, some more coming up. Killing time. Yeah. Okay. So the, the score was, you know, driving in that. I, I must. Have, it was one of those scores that sat in the background and supported the action that was going on. Didn't really dominate. But it's also interesting because the the sound directing and the the music is done by different people. Um, Big Finish often combines those two roles together. But you know, Peter Doggett did the sound design for this one. Ian Morris did the music. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, they work well together. See, the only thing with Time Lord Victorious is that it's such a vast arc that, um, and there's so, so much other stuff around it, it's hard to, to remain focused on the, on the arc all the time. So while these little snippets are enjoyable, there's a kind of a, a slight dissatisfaction with not being as connected to the whole arc as you want to be as a consumer of the entertainment. So... That's why, definitely, once uh, once I get time, which is going to be never, at this at the rate I'm going at the moment, I'd like to, you know, just go through all the Time Lord Vic Victoria stuff that I have, and uh, just put it through in chronological order and do it like, uh, and maybe even follow along again with the podcast that uh, that the guys here at Around the Console are doing, and uh, and go through it again, at least with the stuff that I have, because I did get into some of the, some of the other media, not all of it. But some of it, which is quite yeah. unusual for me to, to read graphic novels. I, I never read graphic novels, but I did for this. No, I did get there. But I'm, I'm certainly relying on the boys to uh, tell me what I'm missing in the other other areas. Awesome. And, uh, get, getting their views as well. Well, yeah, that's our it, views it was, on this one. It is indeed. Thanks, guys. Cryo suspension revival complete. Subject regaining consciousness. From Big Finish Productions, Doctor Who, Time Lord Victorious, Genetics of the Daleks. He was right. This unit has been opened and emptied. Captain? Yes, Swan? Someone's been down here, removing alloys and replication tech. I I'm afraid I'm as much in the dark as you are. All I can tell you is, I'm here to help. Probably means you're in terrible danger. Intruder defense system activated. I will kill you for this! I was wondering, if it's not too much to ask, whether you'd mind terribly locking me up somewhere else, somewhere more secure.
But even so, it's just one Dalek. Oh, it's just one Dalek? Ha! <laughs> Famous last words of countless civilizations. You have done well. They do not suspect. The machine you created for me, activate it. Yes. Big finish. We love stories. All right, we're up to a fourth Doctor episode now, Philip, for Time Lord Victorious. And who, who thanks would have to the... thought? Who would have thought the fourth Doctor was going to come into Time Lord Victorious? Well, yeah, I suppose he would have to, wouldn't he, at some point? Well, I th- well except when all the advertising went out, it was only supposed to be eight, nine, and ten, wasn't it? Yeah. And then they yeah. throw in four, they throw in eleven. I don't know. <laughs> they got they got carried away. But. What did you think of this story, Philip? It was uh, it's it's tied in with this game, Escape Hunt. Which, uh, what is that? What is it? A escape room of some description? I have no idea. You know what? I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> we can't go to it anyway. We can't go to it anyway. We're in the, on the wrong continent. We're thousands of miles away. I have no idea what it was like. And in part, I just don't think you need to know. It, it, it's an interesting one. This is an interesting one to follow. The last one we listened to in terms of the last audio. Mm. Um, which was sort of the Die Hard on a spaceship with the Eighth Doctor, yep. and there seems to be some indication that the the Cyber, I'm not sure the Cyber, the Dalek here may have been from that ship and thrown into the time storm, which is why he's gone back to the Fourth Doctor because the, the Daleks seem to know him. So I'm I'm not sure of all the connections there, and, and part of the problem with not being involved in well, every wasn't media. it the Tenth Doctor who destroyed the Time Squad. And this is the survive, ah. sole surviving Dalek from the Time Squad. I was going to ask that. Is this is, is that what it is? Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. That's what yes. I assumed That's it was. That's explicit in the story. That is yeah. explicit. Oh, well, there you go. I didn't just assume it then. I must have picked it up from the story. <laughs> the, the author must have done the right thing then. <laughs> it made sense. So, yeah. So, I mean, it, it, it follows on quite well from that whole... Um, what was that story called? It's, I've even forgot what that story was called. The David Tennant one. The Die Hard in Space. Well, that was the Eighth Doctor. Oh. That was Mutually Assured Destruction. Right. So that was the last one we listened to, wasn't it? That was the series? last one we listened to, but the but the destruction of the Time Squad, I think, was in the books. Oh. I think it was in the All Flesh is Grass, or it might have been the cliffhanger of... Doesn't the Eighth Doctor destroy the ship at the end of that last one? Oh, I'm lost now. Oh, I'm dear. lost now, but I'm not going to go back and listen to them all again. No, just to either am I. Out. <laughs> well, I think it's a very self, a very good self-contained story. Yes, yeah. Well, uh, hope, I, as it I, hope, hope it, I really hope the chapter have done the story in terms. Of, so ignore us. I'm glad you've got us guys giving you feedback because we oh. really know what we're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just talk about this story then. What did yeah. you enjoy about it, Dwayne? Um, well, when I, I remember when I first heard it, I specifically thought, boy, it's taking a long time for the for the fourth Doctor to appear because it's, there seemed to be. He seems to be out of it for about a third of the stories, just not there. But when he does appear, boy, is does it uh, uh, does he appear with a bang? And it's great to hear him in this universe. He's you know referring to uh, when he eventually gets to talk to the Dalek, and the Dalek starts telling him about his future. Oh, well, I shouldn't know about my future. Uh, but gets just gets on with the story uh, in the as it is. Um, I love the name of the ship, Starship Starship Future. Um, and there's, there's a couple of stories going on within this story. So you've got, you've got the bad guys that are sort of escaping the criminals who are, who are trying to usurp the whole colony when it lands and take over. Uh, then you've got the, you've got the Dalek story as well. But what I really liked about the actual Dalek in this was the, the Dalek mutant side of it as well, because there was... One thing I did like about that special a couple of years ago uh, called Resolution, I did enjoy the Nicholas Briggs portrayal of the Dalek mutant. I thought that was good. Uh, And we've got virtually the same voice here. Um, So with the Dalek mutant trying to get back into the Dalek casing, finally does do that. Uh, And it was, uh, yeah, really, really enjoyable. I enjoyed it. Hmm. So yeah, I really enjoyed it as well. I think the things that stood out for me was it was it, it was interesting how long the, the doctor took to get there. It was almost like a sixth doctor story. <laughs> yeah, almost. <laughs> Off it takes forever. It, it actually felt a bit like Dalek Empire. So the the fact that you had 
um, people alone on a ship with a Dalek, threat growing, no Doctor. It, it actually heightened the sense of all the tension because when the Doctor's not there, things look really bad. So I think that worked really well. You also had the politics happening in terms of the different characters. Um, I really loved the casting of this. Uh, in particular, um, the security officer, Nina Toussaint White, who played Mel, Mel's, yep. in um, Let's Kill Hitler, which I know lots of people don't. I actually, I actually did like that episode. I think it's a lot of fun. I know lots of people. I love don't, it. Yeah, and I love her. Like since that episode, everything. Yeah. Every time I see her name, I just, uh, yeah, yes. I just love everything she's in. She was in Dalek Universe last year. Yes, uh, playing a fantastic part there, uh, yes. and she's equally as good here. Yes. So in terms of and and, and you kind of she she plays cleverly because you both like her and then learn to hate her. And so I think she manages to play those qualities really well that you're never quite sure where you stand with her. But I think all the, all the cast were strong. Um, I think Joseph Kloska did a great job as the pilot in terms of his naivety. Um, I think the, the, the picture of him having lost his family in terms of first using his family as a threat against him then he, when he realised that they were already gone, um, including the children, it was actually, it, it gave a human element. So I think that's really worked really well. Um, my biggest issue with it is probably the fact that the fourth Doctor leaves before he's finished the job. Um, my big issue with the two New Year's Day Dalek specials with Jodie is the fact that, you know, in the first, in Resolution, she blows up the Dalek, but she doesn't actually clean up after herself, which allows the Dalek to be taken, to be reverse engineered, they take DNA swabs of the Dalek, they grow new Dalek mutants, and the entire series second short story in which thousands of people die needlessly is the doctor's fault because she has failed to do what she should have done in that first story here we have the doctor leave and really by the end you realize that the ten thousand people on this ship are all dead because he didn't ensure the fact that the dalek was actually properly dead he didn't dispose of it properly and that it to me that didn't ring true the doctor the doctor doesn't do that so I hated it when it happened with Jody. I hated here that the fourth Doctor hasn't actually cleaned up after himself properly either and allowed a Dalek to survive. And it's actually a really, really bleak ending. So the last couple of minutes, they, they do turn the story around. They do make you sit up and take notice. But when you think through the consequences, I just don't like it because his entire colony ship, you know, are dead because the Doctor's not coming back. He's not coming to rescue them. And he's abandoned them to the face of the Daleks. It's a, yeah. Well, you could also argue that in Genesis of the Daleks, he didn't clean up after himself either. And so the Daleks were created and billions upon billions of people were killed. Yeah, but he, once again, he was, that was where time was supposed to go. Yeah. He, he, and he knew that. And, and he. And we've he seen was, the consequences of him actually doing it in the latest and, Unbound. And exactly. The latest <laughs> Unbound, we saw the consequences of what happens if he did do it. Yeah. Which, which were also awful. He, he uh, in Genesis of Dallas, he, did, he did the right thing, which was you don't change history. But, you know, but, uh, because I mean, the whole Time War really does stem back to that moment where he you know, went back to the creation of the Daleks and attacked them. And even though he didn't wipe them out, as far as the Daleks were concerned, he, he made the attempt. And that allowed the whole time war to start, where Daleks and Time Lords start feeling like they can go back into people's pasts to have a go at wiping them out before they become a problem. Mm. And that's you know that's never right. So I mean may, maybe the Fourth Doctor knew that the, this ship was condemned to be wiped out, and and maybe a line earlier on maybe was that just in attention, a line earlier on in terms of the Doctor knowing this was a doomed mission, and you know he, he, he wonders what happened to this colony because they never arrived. You know he'd often wondered that. And maybe he thinks he's said it right at the end and he's, you know, he's changed things more positively, but in the end it didn't. There's ways around it that could have happened. To me, it was just a bit bleak. But everything else, loved it. Cool. I agree. Good story. Good story. As always, yeah, it's well written, well directed by Jamie Anderson, uh, sound design by Toby. I can never say his name. Just Toby Robinson. Toby Robinson. <laughs> um, yeah. As always, uh, and it was lovely to have Tom Baker involved in this period. And also Tom Baker in a fairly uh, action-packed story. Mm. 
it, 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 it certainly drives along the whole time and I, and I love the drive, the pace, the, the danger, the threat. The Daleks are still being threatening. And, and maybe having that whole first third without the Doctor there added to the whole threat that they are. Yeah. That's our take on genetics of the Daleks. And uh, we'll say back to you boys at Around the Console. So joining us now, we have the writer of Genetics of the Daleks. So Johnny, great to see you again. How are you? Hi, oh, yeah. uh, it's, it's nice to chat to you. Um, yeah, I, it's uh, lovely to be here. And Genetics of the Daleks, I shall cast my mind back. I think that was during the first plague year. I wrote that. <laughs> Under lockdown, yes. Okay. So how how did you come to write for Time Lord Victorious? How were you approached? Uh, it was it was quite late, I think, in the process because, um, uh, as I understand it, Time Lord Victorious started out as um, we'll do books and comics and uh, CDs and stuff a big finish, and then it sort of uh, gathered moss, you know, like a Rolling Stone, and other things started getting connected to it, and. Quite late in the day, the um, the people who did the um, the Dalek escape room wanted to be linked in to Time Lord Victorious, uh, and so I was asked to do a thing, just uh, do a CD which would bridge the gap. Um, at the time, that I mean, it was this was after the whole of the other sort of map of Time Lord Victorious had been worked out, and James Goss, who was in charge of it, sent me the map, and it was it is like. It's like those little sort of games you get at Black of Doctor Who Annuals, where it's move step three forwards, pass a go, you know, um, go down on the stake into there, and that fits in with there. And that's... so I had this huge map, and I was, and I was just going, okay, I'll just fit in that tiny bit in the corner, because um, because it was quite late in the day, was, so I go, I can do this as a sort of um, adjunct, and also part of the brief was uh, this would be a. A CD which need to be standalone. It would be need to be something which could be sold in the shop of the escape room as a souvenir, so that people could buy it when they have no knowledge of anything to do with time of choice. As a sort of example of Big Finish's work of the sort of thing we can do, so you had to work as a first thing you a first ever Doctor Who audio, and it had to also work as tying in with this huge map of Time Lord Victorious. And um, yeah, and so they asked me. <laughs> I always get the good jobs. How how long did you have to write it from commission to? Uh, it it was an odd one, I think, because it was um, it was commissioned before the pandemic happened. It would be um, in the autumn, because and even then the brief changed a few times because they didn't know they would have the Dalek to begin with. Oh no, because I was doing an escape room CD before this and then that didn't happen i don't quite know what the details are because i was just going I, would, I had other things going on but um uh it wasn't it was one of those things that happens where you uh, get asked to do it and you go great and you send off the outline and then you don't hear back for three months and then someone says can you get it done in a week so in or whatever so in the situation you go well did that take three months to do or did that just take a week to do it's sort of both um and this was one of those it was it was but it was designed when i worked out the storyline it was designed to be something that could be written quickly if needed and because it had to tie in with these things with escape room and with tunnel victorious and because of by then the pandemic was happening so it was affecting recordings. I was writing something which um, was deliberately designed so that if that bit fell through or had to be changed, I could do that without having to start again. So it was, it was a sort of a construction kit of a story going, okay, but if the ending has to change, I only have to change a bit of it. Or if the beginning has to change, I only have to change a little bit of it. Or if um, we can't get Tom very much, we can switch it around and make it so Tom's not in it. It's a different doctor. So it was all these different things where um, it had to be a clear, simple story so that I could easily change it if need be. In the end, I don't think I had to change it very much, but um, certainly um, part of the brief was that Tom might not was only available for a morning, I think, to record it. It's like half a day. 
So it's, that's why he doesn't turn up until halfway through okay. the story. Okay, well, actually, that's going to be the question, was why why he's not in for the first half, and that's why he could only record for half. Yeah, or yeah, or at least when I was briefed to write it, the thinking was he might not be available. Um, because I think then, I could be wrong, but I think by then they didn't even have him having a home recording set up. So it was sort of going, could they get it set up? Could they get him into the studio? under some sort of special social distancing situation. I don't know. Because this is before the vaccine and stuff when, you know, uh, people were rightly, you know, very scared and were taking every precaution they could. Now, so the, the, advantage, the, the advantage of not having Tom for the first third half was the fact that you established a lot of very strong characters with their own motivations, their own storylines. Um, I, I said earlier, it's a bit like... Um, what Nick Briggs did with Dalek Empire you almost have a story that you don't need the Doctor um, just travelling along so how deliberate was it in terms of coming up with those characters and you know putting together that strong storyline uh, yeah I think at the time I was watching TV shows like um, The New Lost in Space and a show called um, The Hundred and stuff so I think I was that, that was where I was at in terms of my sort of uh influences and uh yeah it was, it was just um a lot of a lot of the characters had functions as it were so they were there as a way of setting up bits of the storyline um bits of the world or whatever or bits of plot um but yeah but it but it was all um i don't i don't know because <laughs> my camp my idea of characterization is just motivation it's what do they want um you know it's a sort of a checklist of they want this they want this they're trying to keep this secret they're trying to keep this secret and then at the end the end of this process they go oh and they're 45 years old and a woman that but that's i don't really think about those bits of characterization until the end for me the characterization is you know um what they want and their flaws and stuff so uh yeah it, it was um it was, it was also it was one of those things of going, this might have to be recorded very quickly. I need to keep it clear. And I need to keep it um, so that uh, an actor can read one page and hit the ground running. So it was all, it was all deliberate. <laughs> so where does the story sit in relation to the game? Uh, because the, it does end with uh, the Dalek uh, still being alive. So does the game sort of lead on from that or is it set in the middle of the story somewhere uh, it's set between time lord victorious and the game i think um the episode of time lord victorious it ties into um ends with the dalek sort of being psh, out of an escape capsule into space and the escape room begins as a, as a sort of inanimate dalek in um in one of the rooms of this spaceship that's carrying 6,000 people in cryogenic storage. And the Daleks gradually waking up, and the game, I think, was to try and stop the Dalek waking up. Because the Dalek's trying to draw power from the core of the ship and things like that. So the story, genetics of the Daleks, is how the Dalek gets from floating around in space to being on this spaceship with no power but plugged into it. And the, the big sort of... Uh, question i think that, that asks is okay if you're in the escape room and you're you only you've just been woken up from cryogenesis you know like an alien and your mission is to for sort out this dalek what happened to the crew who should have been there yeah the crew who should have been who brought the dalek on board what happened to them and uh so the story genetics is, like, is explaining that sort of gap that sort of plot plot sort of um lacuna in um, the, the the game, because yeah, we were actually discussing that beforehand, uh, the fact that the Doctor had left, and the story sort of hadn't been resolved completely because that Dalek was still there. But that kind of explains why, leading into the uh, escape room. So, yeah, I mean, it is an ideal. I'm not because <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, um, you had, you had it, 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 the one thing I was criticising the story about was it didn't feel to me like the, the doctor had done his job properly because he's abandoned 10,000 people to their fate 
But of course, the, the whole escape room game is about them saving themselves from the Dalek. I assume they're successful by the end. It's okay. If they play it, right? <laughs> yeah, I, mean, well, I, I sort of think of it in things like... Um, uh, because it, it has to be from the Doctor's point of view, he has to quite reasonably think he has solved solved everything. The Dalek is dead. He has saved the day. But then you get this sort of twist at the end: are oh, the Daleks alive? Like in a like in a Stephen King movie, you know, it's like the, the hand shoots up from the grave at the end or whatever. And I was just going, I was just, I was reconciling that. I was going, well, that's like you know, Trial of a Time Lord with the Valyard turning up at the end. You know, it doesn't go anywhere. It could have gone somewhere. Um, the sometimes stories have these little sort of extra bits where the villain turns out not to have been killed and even when it goes nowhere, I was, again, this can be in that grand tradition but, but also this was one of those things of going it could have been that the um, escape room would be closed and would never open again because of the pandemic in which case the story would end, wouldn't have that bit at the ending it would just end with the Doctor saving the day so as you can see, this is me creating a story where I can switch bits on and off, as it were. Brilliant. Okay, well, that's, that's great. Well, so thank you so much for sharing with us about your process. And yeah, excellent. Thank you. Thank you as always. It's, it's great to know what you were doing and why you did it. Thanks, Johnny. Cheers. And it's, um... It needs to be stopped. Ah! Oh. Hello. Don't move. Oh, brilliant. Barely arrived and someone's already got a gun in the face. What happened here? Impressive, isn't it? Impressive? You find a world littered with skeletons, you think it's impressive? It's obscene. Oriv went silent about a week ago. Oh, this is Oriv? The long dead world? No. Wait, a week ago? What do you mean a week ago? Oriv's been dead for millennia. No. A week? No, definitely millennia. Or a week. Shoot it! Uh, Captain, it's about this time I start running. I don't know. Ah. Big finish. We love stories. Well, thanks, boys, for uh, having us back on. This is our last chat about Time Lord Victorious, the final audio adventure that was released uh, by Big Finish. Uh, it was released specifically as or it was designed for LP release. So it's the first Big Finish original LP release. So they've released other stuff on vinyl, but this was specifically made for vinyl. Now, Philip, I want to get your thoughts on this before I give you mine. Oh, well, there you go. Can I say, firstly, I can't believe this was... Well, firstly, that we've managed to go through all the audios um, along the way. And this was over a, over a year ago this was released. It only feels like it just came out. Um, I loved it. So it, it, it was actually strange because it was a very delayed release when um, they had all sorts of problems with producing it in terms of uh, it was supposed to come out much earlier in the production run in the whole uh, Time of Victorious than it did. But because of COVID, because of productions of vinyl, this would end up being unbelievably delayed. And even after it was, it was I was going to say printed is the wrong word. What's the correct word for what do you do with vinyl? Um, stamps? Spin no, it. what's... No, is press. This fun? Pressed. I think you pressed vinyl. Um, even after this story was pressed, um, there was all sorts of del delivery issues. So I know that it caused major issues to people trying to buy the vinyl. And I, and I di didn't get the vinyl. I just bought the download because I'm not that big into vinyl. I mean, I've got lots of records, but I'm not big into vinyl. Um, and so when this finally came out, it was great to hear it, but it was, it was, of course, bizarre because we would have started talking on this record because side A is, of course, how the Time Lord Victorious starts um, with, the with the story with, with Paul McGann. And, of course, this now finishes and wraps up the whole series with David Tennant on side B. So it was an amazing concept. I said for vinyl, and therefore it had to be written exactly to fit the time that they had. Which of course, you know, meant that you're writing a story to about a 30-minute um, time frame, which of course is a very unusual. I guess I guess they're single episodes and similar to that. Um, and I I think the first 15, 20 minutes I think is amazing. So I love that you've got this group of mercenaries out hunting something. You're not quite sure what they're hunting. Um, I guess if you listen to the if you just listen to the two together, I actually didn't listen to side A beforehand. I just went straight into the story. 
Yeah, and so I'd kind of forgot. So I'd kind of forgotten how it had started, and I'd forgotten about the beasts that they were hunting, all those things. So because I hit it totally fresh, and it'd been a while since we listened to part A, um, I really wasn't. I couldn't quite remember how it fitted together, and so stunning cast. I mean, I think Arthur Darvall is just amazing. Um, I'm trying to think who, who's the woman who's the captain. Oh, Mina Anwar. Um, is in this as well? I think it's yes, Joshi. Um, yeah, I mean, once again, I've forgotten Arthur Darvall was in this. I don't recognize his voice and audio, which is interesting. I've actually just started re listening to The Lone Centurion because I actually didn't listen to that when it came out, and I, I've been listening to that for the last couple of days. Um, his voice isn't really distinctive. I mean, I, I don't mind it, it's good, but I, it doesn't stand out. And so when he was playing Cookie, um, I'd miss that again. I had to go to the credits. Love the first 20 minutes. I love how the story progresses. I love the hunting. I love the way they get split up. I think Burn Gorman makes a wonderful monster. Those not in this episode anywhere near enough. More on the other side. But the last five minutes to me don't... is sort of trying to wrap things up. And I just really don't quite get the last five minutes. So maybe, maybe I got distracted at the end of it. But I was really enjoying the story, enjoying the hunt. And then it sort of just ended. But... Maybe I'm being too harsh. What, what did you think, Dwayne? Okay. I'm glad you said that because we're on similar wavelengths here. I jumped into this uh, without listening to the other side. And I was coming away at the end of it feeling rather flat. And I was trying to, trying to work out why. And I could compare this concept, Time Lord Victorious, to a classic television series that there was. And that was The Key to Time. In the key to time, we had an overarching theme that was, you know, a quest. It was a quest theme, basically, which is similar to Time of Victorious, but uh, obviously much more detail in TLV. But the key to time was supposed to build up and up and up and get to a crescendo. And then something pretty magnificent was, was supposed to happen with the key to time at the end. We had some fantastic stories within the key to time season, but the actual concept of the key to time fell flat at the end when the doctor breaks up the key right at the end has a little confrontation with the black guardian i have always thought what was all that for if that's all that was going to happen what was the point and i felt very similar with time lord victorious some great stories within it uh, i kept finding myself because they were so spread apart and i was listening to them apart i was trying to find the internet interconnecting pieces Sometimes they're hard to find, sometimes they're easy, um, but I had that I had that feeling of not being completely satisfied with the with the arc at the end of this. And once again, this has got all the ingredients. It's got Paul McGann, it's got David Tennant, it's got Tom Baker, uh, it's got uh, the Ninth Doctor in in some of the media as well. It's got the production. It's got this. The Dark Times, which is always a mysterious kind of period for fans. All those ingredients are there. So on paper, it looks fantastic. But in the execution of it, I don't think it works. Because I've come away from it after listening to it today, not really knowing what I heard, if that makes sense. Um, and I just, I, because of the, the bulk of audio that's out there and new stuff and old stuff that I want to listen to again I'm not going to go back and and try and and dive deeply into Time Lord Victorious so um, while everything was good as I said production was good yeah I had that I had that little flat feeling does that make sense yeah it does um, I do understand what you're saying you're right there's, there's a lot every component there's lots of components in here that work really well there's so many good stories oh and don't forget the daleks i think the daleks in time lord victorious are some of the most interesting daleks in the history of doctor who yes. so just yep. them just them on their own uh, are, fa are fascinating as well so that was a highlight for for the whole series for me yeah i guess for me i i don't quite get what is the time lord victorious that yeah, it, it's a phrase that was that came from the waters of Mars, where David Tennant, as Doctor, without a companion, starts to believe he can do anything and he has the right to do anything as the last Time Lord, and then gets shot down 
well, he doesn't get shot down. Um, the, whoever the, the 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 person he rescues shoots herself down, and ends his ends his reign. So it was an interesting point to, to use the Time Lord Victorious as the leaking narrative for all these stories, because in some part he he declared himself the Time Lord Victorious in one show, and in the same show he realised he wasn't, and he actually came crashing down. So I'm not quite sure why they decided to run with that as the theme. I'm not quite sure how the theme ran throughout anyhow. You know, the Tom Beckett, Gen- Genetics of the Daleks, I loved Genetics of the Daleks as a story. Mm. But how is that Time Lord Victorious? I don't, I don't understand how it linked, particularly. And as you say, what is the through line? P- partly, I think, maybe because they kept changing mediums. I, I think it's a bold concept. I love what the BBC did. I love the fact that they worked out that fans wanted Doctor Who. They weren't getting enough Doctor Who with just the 13th Doctor and with how the seasons were being filmed and because the seasons had been reduced down to much fewer episodes. And so the BBC realised fans wanted more. They had an opportunity to pull out the best of Doctors in terms of 8, 9, 10. And, and then you throw in a bit of 11 as well and 4. And so they, they, they went to that. But because it kept changing mediums, some audio, some books, then you know, playing around with vinyl, that they wanted a vinyl release. Um, then throw in um, escape rooms, cartoons, um, comics, um, also graphic novels. The, the constant change of mediums, the fact that you couldn't follow all... Well, I'm not sure anyone could follow all the mediums. I think the, the boys who are doing this have done the best job of trying to follow through every production. But it's going to be very hard for any person to follow it through. And so recognising that, they did make them more separate entities. But by making them more separate entities, you therefore lost the cohesion of what, you, what you're trying to tell. So mm. I don't really know what they were trying to do with this series. I don't know what, what story they were trying to tell, whose story they were trying to tell. Is this the Time Lord Victorious? Is this the David Tennant Doctor learning his life's lessons? Because they kind of imply that at the end, or it's he at least has sympathy when he listens to the Eighth Doctor's voice, realizing the Eighth Doctor's about to embark on this huge journey. But also, once again, recognize the fact that you know the Eighth Doctor, the Ninth Doctor, the Tenth Doctors—they're they're decades, if not centuries, apart. These mm. stories are happening. So yeah, they, they, there's a few little things. I, I'm, yeah, I'm really hoping to get Alfie Shaw and have a chat with Alfie and actually try and understand what his brief was and how they managed to put it all together. Hmm, for sure. So that's uh, that's it for Time Lord Victorious. Thanks, guys, at Around the Console for allowing us to say a few things about them. Really appreciate that. Did you know, Philip, that they suggested that we suggest some other audios for them to review now that Time Lord Victorious is over for them? Oh, okay. Do we what would you suggest for them? Review a re- <laughs> 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 mix it up i say if there was something that they should review what do you think uh would be a good one for them to review as a team you know i think it's really hard to try and give them one thing to do i mean i guess we could try and tell them what are some of the best episodes in our opinion in terms of a big finish i actually think a good thing for them to do is just do some random stuff and just you know pick, pick randomly one from each doctor and just see what they end up with because there's so much material there and you know I could suggest all kinds of things. I guess I'd like to know a bit more about what sort of stuff they want to listen to. Or maybe, you know, maybe we try and find them a historical, a fantasy, a out there, because we could easily do that too. So, yeah. We did it. I, I, when someone says, what do you, what, what should I listen to? I like to quiz them a bit more about what do you like and then give them something of what they like and then something that's totally opposite. So, you know, boys, you want to do something? Let me know what you like um, and I'll, I'll give you an idea of what you might want to do. All right. Thanks, Philip. Is there something for them or not, Dwayne? Just no, I was going to let spot. you go first. I was going to oh. let you go first. <laughs> I'm letting you go second. Well, I, if I, if I was going to choose something, I, I would choose potentially the uh, the villains trilogy from uh, because there you get one from the fifth, sixth, and seventh Doctor, and I think yep. they're all great stories. And if anything's going to turn them right on to audio, it's going to be those three. Actually, you know the other thing that they'd probably love too is new monsters, old doctors. 
the yep. class, classic doctors. I think that, that, that those box sets once again, where you actually merge and mesh those two yep. things, I think they'd really enjoy that in terms of seeing what can you do with the new monsters of the TV series, throw them with the classic doctors, and uh, get that get that mesh to happen. Because I think I think they'd enjoy that too. Very good. There's some tips for you, boys. We'll catch you around. So, Alfie, one of the things that you have done is the Time Lord Victorious, and I believe that mm. you were. How, how did that whole idea come about in terms of what the what the BBC wanted to do? How Big Finch was going to get involved? Your role. How, how did Time Lord Victorious come about for you? I mean, I wish it had some big dramatic story, but it starts the same way most of these things. Story was that I got an email, uh, and this one was an email from Nick going, "Hello, um, are you free tomorrow?" There's a BBC thing, and we'd like you to to run it. Uh, um, yeah, okay, cool. Uh, what is this? And I, well, here's here's the series guide. And so we got a document from the BBC, basically saying what they wanted, which is was at the time uh, three three stories with McGann, a vinyl, and two, and short trips. The Tom Baker one was uh, came later down the line. And so we went into a, a meeting with the BBC and this was, this sort of grand vision was laid out for us. Um, so who was doing that, would, who, who's doing that in the BBC? Who's, it was a BBC vision? Uh, it was, it was Goss's, uh, Goss was running the, Goss was running the show. And so it was Goss who, I think it was Goss who put the storyline together. You'd have to ask him. But when we got it, Goss was in charge of, especially the creative side of it. Um, and so we had a, a meeting with him, which was mainly mainly marketing, I must confess, but I, there was some, some creative elements for, for me to pick on. Um, and so we were also given the structure of the, of the, the main re- McGann run as well, which was uh, first story with Brian the Ude, must centre around Brian and the Doctor and the sort of temporal weirdness is very must very much be a sort of background thing. Uh, second story is... Eight and Daleks, and at the end of that, they head off to the dark times. And then story three, we've done the battle. Um, and he gave an example of a couple of Blake Seven episodes, which I'm afraid I haven't seen. But there is apparently a Blake Seven story where they go off to fight, and the next episode, the battle's battle. happened, and they've all lost. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, so it was it was that structure, and then we were told, die hard on, die hard with the Daleks for the last. Uh, for mutually assured destruction. Okay. Yes. Um, in terms of the short trips, we were basically given a car, whatever you want to do, you know, find something in a new interesting angle on it. Uh, so we very quickly settled on the master because that wasn't to the best of my knowledge being explored elsewhere in the time of Victorious arc. And it was, it was a nice way of going, well, we've got the heroes approach this, let's get a villain involved. Um, I think this has been said elsewhere, so I can say this, they were originally meant to be Alex McQueen. Um, right. but then um, Alex wasn't available and you get someone like John and you know that not only was John available but well, actually then that we can do two different versions of the master um, both of which haven't really had much play at Big Finish uh, before so that was sort of an exciting thing to do and that made that a bit more special um, and the, the vinyl in terms of plot brief um we went through a lot of different outlines on that. Dolly and I pitched a lot of different things, um, which wasn't quite what they were they were looking for. And we eventually settled on this sort of alien Prometheus style prologue, epilogue piece, um, which was very, uh, that of all the productions was quite hit by uh, COVID and had a fair few changes because of it. Uh, I mean, we were recording Time War Victorious I mean, everyone says Shadow of the Sun was the first recording, so I will take their word for it. But we were the next day. I mean, we were very hot on this. It was, there was a point where James went, can we do these? Do we have to turn them into someone re- reading them as audio books? You know, there was a point James talked about where he was worried the whole project was gonna just uh, disappear. Um, but we went, no, 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 don't worry, we, we can do this. Um, and so all of that was made in lockdown, wonderfully managed by Scott, who grabbed people here and there and sort of do lots of individual recording sessions. If you look at the recording dates for Echoes, it's just, I mean, there's like six or seven dates on there. It's so yep. many people. Um, but yes, I mean, one of the major things that we changed about Echoes 
um, was it wasn't originally David Tennant. It was originally a pre-McGann doctor who for code reasons we couldn't get. So the structure was initially, which is where the kind of play any order thing really came from, uh, was that you would kick off with the, the prequel with the later doctor, and then you would have the sequel with the earlier doctor. And that would be where the kind of play in any order sort of tiny wimey element of it came about. Um, and then we, uh, for due to various reasons, we couldn't get that, we couldn't record with that doctor. Um, but we were at that point recording with David Tennant. Obviously Time Lobby Taurus is, is about the 10th doctor in quite a major way. So we were very fortunate and very lucky that we went, COVID. could we get David? Well, uh, no, that's, I'm not, I'm not saying that that's a lucky thing. That would be horrific. Um, it's, it's, a, but, it's, a, it's a silver lining of a very dark cloud. Yes. Um, yes. In those dark times, we were able to find uh, joyous things. Uh, and one of these things was that David was recording and we were able to get him involved in, in that side of the vinyl, which, um, which then shifted everyone's expectations on it in quite a weird way because it was then delayed quite a lot as well because of the pressing yep. and the things like that. So it was, it was always meant to be this very sort of sidestep in the whole thing. Um, and by the end of it, it featured the main doctor and was coming out last. So everyone was there going, oh my God, this is the finale. This is, this is the big finale. And they go, no, please don't expect the finale. You're really going to be disappointed. This is just its own little little thing at the side. And then, then you know, everyone's going, you know, Dark Universe was, I love Dark Universe, which says you should. Dark Universe was brilliant. But they go, oh, well, this is much better than this side thing. I went, oh, yeah, because Dark Universe was designed like that. And it was magnificent from that way. And this one, we had this, this great little side thing, but it was always meant to be a side thing. And people, I think, kind of, it got elevated, just mainly due to the delays and things. Um, yeah, and being on vinyl and being a new yeah, I think there's lots of things happened yeah is, there was it, lots of factors is, is it fair to say that most of what Big Finish produces tends to be creatively driven and so yourself someone like Dave Richardson Nick has a creative idea in terms of where they want to drive stories or characters etc I mean, and of course there's a, there's, a, there's a financial thinking behind it I mean it's a company that's going to make money it can't, they can't fail mm. but it's driven creatively primarily it's, a, it's an idea, a thought, a character um, to, to take take a story or a sequence. Time Lord Victoria is because it was BBC initiative. It feels more it was merchandise driven rather than creatively driven. Is that fair to say or is that too harsh? I would think, I, I would personally say that's too harsh. Um, but I can see possibly externally. Um, it was always driven by Goss's vision. And it was always the design was always that you could tell what was what was exciting about it internally was this creative it's this massive thing of who and it's all of the licensees kind of coming together and working together to make this great vision so there was no you know there was no meeting as far as i'm aware they go ah oh, good we we can just kind of you know this will this will this is just because of the money. There was always goss. It was always, you know, meant to be doing creative things. I think just to say it's about merchandising is um, solely about merchandising is very unfair. As you say, these things are businesses. They need to make money. It got a big marketing push, um, but there's a lot of really kind of, I'd say great elements to uh, Time of Victorious. I'm very fortunate that we got to play with two of my favorites, which was Brian the Assassin. Oh, Brian the Assassin. Um, <laughs> and the Dalek Time Squad, and who I think were kind of great creations and were there from the off, and Goss wanted to tell stories with these characters. So there is always, you know, just to be, as you say, it's this sort of balance of business and creative. Um, and there is always, to every creative endeavor, um, a business element, whether it's just budget, whether it's, you know, how do we market this? Whether, oh, will this be a sort of popular idea? Um, but then it always comes back to the creative and how do we do this in the best way possible. So it was always it was always driven as a as a creative thing. Um, you know, when when you do something at Big Finish, there are less cooks in the kitchen, um, so you're less trying to balance stories with other places. So Time of Victorious, there were a lot more kind of moving parts than your sort of traditional. Well, like the you know the Dark Universe comparison is quite good because it's 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 got a little prologue, but then it is three box sets and you're done. 
you know, Time of Victorious was this kind of big taking into other accounts what's happening over in the books and what's happening with the comics and kind of trying to tie all that together. Um, so I would, there is my rousing defense of it as a creative endeavor. Um, but yes, obviously there are, you know, financial elements to all of these things, but it is always creative letter when you've got someone like James Goss leading it. It couldn't, it couldn't be anything but a, a sort of creative endeavor. Yeah, I guess for me in terms of, I mean, I think the individual parts work mostly really well but mm. for me i mean I, as i said for me audios i got the books um i looked at the, the youtube stuff the, the comic stuff um so there's a, a, a I, I was able to dip into a large amount of it but for mm. me i really struggled with the overall where it was going what it was doing and i guess yeah i, I it just, it's just in terms of whether we think it succeeded well enough in terms of, of, a, of a big picture idea? I think um, there are lessons to be learned from it. And I say this because I sent a very long email when we were asked for feedback. So I think there are lots of things you could learn from it. Um, but I think as a as a kind of first stab uh, at something like this, and the way it was trying to do it, especially in terms of the patchwork stuff, um, I personally think it sort of set up, it achieved what it set out to do. I'm not, you know, you, you uh, disagree, and that's great. Um, no, no, I'm not disagreeing. I can, no, 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 but, sorry. Know, <laughs> I, can, I, can see, I can see why there are, you know, some, some people, there, there are things that could be uh, uh, tweaked with it. Um, but yes, it is a, it is a, it was a huge endeavor uh, done under very difficult circumstances. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I, I'm so I'm not saying, so saying it failed, and as I said, I enjoyed all the parts. So I mean, you know, hmm. all the big finished parts I really enjoyed. I, the, the two short trips, I think, are utterly brilliant. Um, hmm. And that's that would be what I heard first. I'm sure that they, they must have come out first. And I, and I thought hearing the two masters, I, and then yeah, I think, I think you're right. The 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 western I loved, um, mutually assured destruction. I thought was brilliant. Um, oh, the depressingness of the end reminded me. I got the two books. And really enjoyed them, so yeah, I, I did enjoy all the parts. For me, the mm. struggle wasn't, and maybe you know, I'm getting old, and I just yeah, I struggled with, <laughs> with the, the through line through it all. Um, was was just the sort of thing that, to just try to understand how the through line works. Is is there actually something you can read in terms of the synopsis of the whole scenario? Do you know? Does it, did James actually do a? There is a there was a, there was a timeline somewhere, but I've it got, is kind which of which tells you the order that you can see stuff in. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in terms of the actual event, the 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 story, the core story is really just the two books. I think that's kind of that's the kind of core of the the event, and then everything else is sort of either build up or aftershock. Um, okay. Which is which is always kind of how I I viewed it. Or in terms of, in case of Echo's very beginning and, and very end, um, but yes, I think the the core of the the narrative was was, was the books, um, mainly because that's when the Tenth Doctor does the that's the wiping out of the Katuru, and then the next book is all the Doctors rock up. Um, so that's always kind of how I approached approached it was that we were tying in, we were all sort of floating was not floating that's what orbiting the core which was the books now you allocate yourself to write the final part in terms of the um echoes of extinction um was that your choice somebody else's choice who said that you could write it uh nick said i should write it good when i when i came on nick said i should write it and i just done ex machina for goss so he approved the choice um so i took it on that way i did not in any way go you know I'm going to write any of these particular ones but when, Nick said I should write one and I thought well I shouldn't do any of the main trilogy that should be new, new voices uh, different voices for cause since we're doing a, a big event get some, get some fresh new voices on that um, and you know I'll uh, I can't remember who said I should do the vinyl someone it was it was sort of I was sort of once I ruled myself out of that I was sort of said okay well why don't you why don't you take this this one on over here um, yes 
So writing eighth doctor, tenth doctor, how did you approach two different doctors? Well, I mean, as I alluded to earlier, it wasn't originally eight and ten. Um, it was originally uh, seven. Is that what you're saying? Or you uh, say? and, uh, at a previous doctor. Um, but eight was great. I loved. I, I loved. I, I kind of. I, I guess I was, you know, growing up in this sort of the wilderness years. I'd always wanted to do do an eighth doctor one. Um, it was quite a challenge um, writing wise because it had to be half an hour. It wasn't like um, Generation Impossible or Rear Guard, for instance, which is a, a later short trip where they're both 5,000 words, but just because Jake rattles through things quickly, Regeneration Impossible was under half an hour and Rear Guard was 40 minutes. Because it was on a vinyl, you only had strictly half an hour. Um, so it was trying to tell a sort of interesting story in the style of the H Doctor adventure. So you've got to have sort of romance and intrigue and you know, a threatening monster and all these sort of things. You've got to really crunch it down into half an hour. Um, so that was really the, the challenge. And I had, um, I was very keen to keep Matt and John involved in Time War Victorious um, because they've done, you know, they're, they're, as I say, geniuses, but also they work on the Eighth Doctor a lot and they know that voice. Um, so Matt took the, the main trilogy and John was helping me on the vinyl. Uh, so it was really great having him guide me on the Eighth Doctor's voice. Um, and then uh, they, uh, when we couldn't get the, the earlier Doctor, there was a brief moment where it was going to be eight and 11. So I then, uh, I rewrote the, um, the other, the other side the, to be 11. Although at that point, most of the other guest cast had recorded. So I couldn't then retool it. So the idea of the other side was initially that it would be in the style of this earlier doctor, which is why it's more of a sort of, it's, it's, uh, you know, less complex, uh, complex narrative wise it's a sort of more simple plot um so i'd 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 you know maybe like to have um shot it around to be a something a bit more sort of weird and lengthy um but that wasn't possible um so that was written and then we got the call going david's available um and so it was then rewritten for 10 uh which was i i i mean what a way to do a Taylor Tennant. Uh, I, it's, I mean, it's in my mum's kitchen framed and it's next to my sister graduating from Cambridge uh, law degree, you know, acing Cambridge University. And anyone who comes over, forget that really impressive thing. Oh my God, that's David Tennant and your name underneath it. Like, yeah, yeah, it is. Um, <laughs> so that was really great to do. Um, but again, you had that kind of... Um, we were limited because all the other parts had been recorded just because of the way that the production kind of come along. Um, so it was, it was really just a matter of changing things to be Ten's dialogue. And then it found out, uh, it turned out, because originally uh, the doctors did talk at the end. Um, they, they had a little chat with each other, but because of the runtime on the vinyl, that wasn't uh, possible. So we then, we had a whole load of stuff recorded with Paul. We cut all that down so it's just him talking and then Ten cuts him off and does that speech. So sort of tries to do a sort of nice uh, cap, not only to Tom of Victorious, but leading into the fact that, oh, you've got the time war coming, so sorry. Um, and move that forward. So that was, that was kind of how that happened. And it's that weird thing of when you're in the moment, at least for me, you don't really... I don't really think about what a big deal it is. So when we were doing the Australia conspiracy with uh, Liz Miles, I wasn't there going, this is the first bit of the finished 12th Doctor. Oh, oh, oh. It was just, we've got 12th Doctor. We need to make this as good as we can. You know, we've got loads more of these to do. And you're just in the, the sort of, you're in the trenches. You're going through it. You're really trying to just make this as good as you can. Uh, so it's only on the other side when, as I say, people come round to the mums or they see my copies up in the hall. They go, "Oh, that's really cool." And you go, "Yeah, yeah, it was." I was just going <sighs> at the time to, uh, <laughs> to get this thing finished, um, but it was a real, it was a real, um, real privilege to do. I mean, what a great pair 
uh, and such fabulous actors. And Scott pulled together, I mean, it's just a who's who of brilliant Doctor Who and spit off alumni for it. Uh, so there are such huge names. Um, mm. <laughs> is, you know, and of course, they make the parts their own, but they're just like they're huge star parts, but just huge names playing these parts. It was, it's, yeah, it's astounding that you've got them. Mm. Well, that's that's the power of, of, of Scott. He just knows all these people. He knows all these brilliant people and is so friendly with all of them that he can go, hello, Burn Gold, would you like to play as the floating psychic entity? And Paul Clayton just coming in and being this very rude robotic butler. It's like, yes, victory. This is amazing. Uh, but all of that was really down to, to Scott, and Scott was a huge help. It must be stressed across the whole process, just directing people and making getting all these recordings done. Uh, so yeah, it was a it was a really difficult project, but everyone you know from the BBC all the way downwards really pulled together uh, to make it happen. This has been the Science of Audio episode one hundred and ninety four, Time Lord Victorious: The Audio Reviews, with our guests Jonathan Morris and Alfie Shaw, with your hosts Philip Edney and Dwayne Bunny. Theme music by Joe Kramer. More about us at sirensofaudio.com. Comment below to give us your feedback. Contact us via email at sirensofaudio at gmail.com or via any one of our socials using the handle at audiosirens. Thanks for listening, audiophiles. We'll hear you next time.